just like keep your torch lit. We got Ian here of uh, season two through five editor, season six player. I thought you said that uh, you'd never, never play the game ever. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, that is true, except for this, this one time, except for this, you know, there's an exception to every rule, you know? And so uh, in general, it is true that I would, I would never play Survivor um, after editing all of these seasons and seeing everybody cry and all this kind of stuff. But what I left out was that when I played season six, I hadn't seen all of that stuff yet because I hadn't edited all the seasons yet. I'd only edited season two. And yeah, I did see everybody cry and stuff in person, but um, it's not the same as, you know, having to relive it for, for hundreds and hundreds of days, editing it all and going through the emotional turmoil of it. So like if I had edited all stars, maybe I wouldn't have played season six, but because I'd only edited season two, which, you know, grand scheme of things, a relatively drama, Dra less drama season than some of the others. I guess that's crazy to say. That's actually a ridiculous thing to say. The point is I did play and I was just lying about it to, to everybody online. Yeah, my phone's my phone's blowing up, dude. I'm getting uh, lots of people messaging me like, bro, why didn't you lie about this, dude? Why didn't you tell me that you played? So that's good to know. It's Wait, good to see. they change? Oh, is there a new YouTube account? Yeah, yeah. If you're listening to this, go, go subscribe to Survivor Michigan Gen 2 new 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 era new channel you know so uh definitely go check that out it's gonna be gonna be all kinds of great content coming your way so is the survivor michigan one just forever like i think i, well, I think we'll just change the, the name five? of that one to to gen one and then it'll just be kind of like a defunct immortalized yeah it'll be oh, it'll nice. be done more or less you know that's crazy. Uh, i mean you know we don't want um people to it's like an internal club thing basically but just it makes more sense for each like group of people to like just be the only ones having access to their own thing and like the younger people don't want us older geezers involved in their shit and yeah. you know so on so it's just like it seemed to make the most sense yeah that makes sense yeah they don't want the younger ones don't want the uh the older people involved with you know, generation two, there's no way anyone from that's no, involved. yeah, yeah, yeah. Any Nobody involvement. from gen one would have any role in gen two, certainly not as a player. <laughs> so, uh, uh yeah, you're the only one, right? This is only Ian, you know, we were seeing no other remnants of gen one, so in gen two, that's it, yeah, that's it. Nobody else from gen one, I'm pretty sure, right? Like, nobody else from gen one ever played again, to my knowledge, so you know. Or I guess me and yeah. Noah played for the first time. I don't know why I said that played again. That doesn't even make sense with what I said. Everybody from me, Noah, George, and Katie hadn't played before. So, like, there would um, never be someone from Gen 1 who played on Gen 2. I Not that I am aware of. Obviously, obviously not. Obviously, everything we say, too, is 100% truthful and should be taken. I've, I've at, never uh, lied. I have never <laughs> lied to the never audience. Lied. I've no, never, never told a lie. I've not heard one lie. No. Yeah. I only speak yeah. the truth. Yeah. So just, just so you know, everything said in these podcasts, 100% canon, 100% believable, never will be contradicted at any point in the future. That's true. Um, you can I, trust, I, you can trust everything we say. Like at this point, but, um, so, I mean, I know there's a lot of stuff that we want to talk about for you, like in, in All-Stars and kind of like, you know, get your take on All-Stars. We have a lot of questions, but, you know, figure that we can since this trailer just did get re released, uh, it makes sense to talk a little bit about uh, just season six and, and Gen two in general. Like, so this season six did it happen right after All Stars? Like, what what happened in the kind of how did this chronologically work? Yeah, so season six was the semester after All Stars, so it was the last semester that me and Katie were in college. So we had like wanted to play forever and ever, you know, like, and. Um, I had applied for season four and not got cast. And at that point I pretty much was like, I, you are going like, you're going to cast me at season six. Like you can't not cast me. Like I thought it was ridiculous. I didn't get cast for season four. And oh, so wait, I, was, like, I forgot you applied for season four. Yeah. I thought it was. And so for season <laughs> six, when I applied um, that time, it was more like I knew, I, I knew they were going to cast me because I remember in my interview, they were, it was like Matthew and I think a few other people. And they were like, so what, like how will, much will upset you if you're not cast? And I said, well, if you don't cast me, there's not going to be a seasons three, four, and five. Like I will not like <laughs> I, that. Obviously, isn't true, but like I was like, yeah, 
why would I edit three more seasons of this if you guys like aren't going to cast me? Like that's ridiculous. Like I'm putting so much work into this. Like I I just want to play. I want to see how I can do. I after seeing my friends go through it for so many so many semesters, I really wanted to know what it was like. I really wanted to experience it myself. Um, so I really wanted to play, and uh, like you know, so I was really excited. I was really excited about it. Um, and uh, the other people, the other producers, I'll let them like speak to their own their own stories about why why they did season six but for me yeah. i just really wanted to play and i had wanted to play the whole time and i was like i just want you want to know there's a part of you that wants to know you know you want to know how how you would do on the season so yeah so i played season, season six people you know play survivor for multiple seasons and, and edited them and, and basically all it sounds like in the trailer you're saying that all of them have been doing it wrong that is correct yeah that is correct. Yeah, the every pretty much, uh, yeah. My belief system was that people have been playing Survivor wrong, and I was here to show them, you know, the true, the true light, <laughs> the true way. I don't know. I don't know what the context is for that line. Like, I, I'm sure I'm referring specifically to somebody like on the season or something. But so going into the game, like, did you have what was? Do you have any sort of strategy like beforehand? Like, let's say that this is. Let's say it's December 2019, you know, All Stars is finishing, wrapping up. You know that like season six casting's probably happening. You're thinking about season six. You know, what's what's on your mind for like I mean, I was extreme I was extraordinarily nervous. I remember being insanely nervous. I mean, I don't wanna I don't wanna say too much about my strategy or anything, you know. I don't wanna wanna spoil anything. Like everyone should just watch the season, you know. It's it's a great, great, great season and uh everybody should watch it. But um uh, I remember being really, really nervous and I was really, really scared about there being like a big target on my back potentially because of my role in the show and stuff like that. So those are the things I was nervous about. And um, I also like I kind of had heard rumors that like Katie and Noah might be applying, but I did not know uh, for sure what was going on with that. And I had no idea that George was going to be on the season. So uh that was a shock to be sure when I showed up the first day and George was there. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Gen two also like, there's two trailers that got dropped today. We also saw a nice look at like gen two in general seasons uh, six and beyond. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wait, you you should. Yeah. Yeah. There's two yeah. trailers, gen two, gen two, lots of legends. Like, it's gonna be nuts, dude. Yeah, everybody it's, should. A lot of people that I like didn't even know who they were, but I was like, I want to see. I want to see who these people are. They sound. There's a lot of great lines. They sound funny. Yeah, yeah. Gen two, Gen two, best gen. That's what everyone says. That's what. That's what, what? I've heard. Honestly, yeah, yeah. like. Um, second is so the best. I've first yeah. Is the first, first is the worst. Second is the best. Third is the one with the treasure chest. Right. A gen three. About gen. Now. Three. Gen three was entirely pirate themed. The entire generation was pirate <laughs> themed, so that's where the treasure chest comes in. But uh, yeah, so that's season six. Great, great season. Um, I think it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be fantastic, and I can't wait to can't wait to see it. So was a lot of it that. online. Um, no spoilers, but you know you can do, you can make your own. Uh, I don't know. No spoilers. <laughs> I think they said at the very beginning the trailer that they start filming in January of 2020. Ah, uh, yeah. I remember this. Yeah. 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 And then it says it's airing this fall. That's like, it's kind of crazy. It's like coming. That's coming up. I know. I know. That's what I heard. So, yeah. And I also heard that if it's airing in the fall, that means it's guaranteed to come out in like, you know, September, October, right? Because they, they would never say this fall if they didn't mean like <laughs> early fall. Like when I think no. of fall, I think of, you know, the leaves changing, college football, Halloween, yeah, football, like know. September, October are fall months. November is like borderline. December is definitely winter. So when yeah, they no, said no, this no fall. Ever have a December release for no. you know, they said fall. I've that would just be that. ridiculous. It wouldn't even make sense. So when they're saying this fall, they're actually the people who are editing this. They've promised you a September. Like, they promised and, you like Labor Day, probably, right? Isn't that beginning of fall? Yeah, like fall I've actually it, heard right? that that is the release date. I, I can't confirm it, but I've heard that rumored. So you know, if you're out there listening to this, make sure to hound the editors and tell them that you want to see this thing in the fall. Because anything later than Halloween at last would be just like, you know, fake. 
Yeah, it would be, it'd be a complete lie and, and a fabrication. Dang, yeah. I'm actually impressed. I didn't think it was being edited that fast. I mean, I, it kind of makes sense in that, like, since there's different editing teams for these future seasons, it, it was, there is a, people were able to work on them, like, kind of simultaneously as, as season five. Yeah. Was so it's one of the benefits of kind of having these multiple teams. Gen 2, great stuff, very exciting. Um, but we still got to put a, put a cap on Gen 1 here and, uh, and the All-Stars stuff because that's what you've been working on for a very, very long time. So how's it feel, Ian? Like it's, it's done. All-Stars is done. You know what? The, um, I thought I was going to be a lot sadder about it than I actually have been. Like it was a very emotional thing for everyone involved. But I think that like going to Vegas with everybody, watching it together – and I actually got to watch it twice with people from Survivor because I, um, some people who were in New York who couldn't make it to Vegas, I watched it with them like a week before also. So I got to like mm. cry with everybody about it like two different times. And um, through all of that, like it was kind of like a big group hug afterwards, you know, for a while. And uh, it felt very, very, um, very, very cathartic. And so for a really long time, I thought I was going to be really, really sad about it. But that hasn't really set in yet. Like maybe it will sit in at some point. But right now I'm just like enjoying life. Like I've been playing pickleball with my friends. I've been going to the gym. Like I've been uh, catching up on shows and stuff. I, I watched the succession nice. finale last night. You know, I love that. Yeah, like, so, um, so uh, yeah, it, the, the, the word I would use to say is satisfied. Like I feel very satisfied. I feel like. I did exactly what I said I was going to do. And I feel my biggest fear was always that like, it wouldn't be as good as I wanted it to be, or the season wouldn't turn out how I wanted it to. And somewhere in the middle, I was kind of concerned about that. Like the reception wasn't as positive as I wanted it to be from some corners, from some places. Yeah. And uh, I was worried about it, but you know, I stuck to my guns and uh, the last couple episodes, especially turned out like exactly as I had imagined them all these years. And so I feel very satisfied with how it turned out and I feel like I'll always be able to look back on it and be like, just very excited about it, you know? Yeah. It's got to feel nice to have uh, so much more free time. It is really nice. Honestly, it sounds like everyone who played was satisfied or most everyone who played was satisfied with their edit, which is pretty hard to do. So that's definitely a win. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel very like every, I don't know anybody who's like, I mean, they obviously, I guess they wouldn't tell me if they were, but I'm pretty sure that nobody <laughs> is unhappy with their edit. I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. everybody liked their edit and the vast majority of people felt like they were shown, you know, in a really positive yeah. light, more or less, and that their whole, their whole thing got shown. So that was always my goal. And there was really specific parts that I, you know, had had in my head for a really long time. And those parts worked. So like when I was watching with everybody and the two parts that like the main, that the survivor group, when we were all together watching it, like that people cried at was obviously the end. And then also the scene where Cooper in Cooper's like send off. It was interesting. Like, so when crouch gets voted off, there was obviously the crouch montage and everybody we were watching with like 20 of us, everybody was like cheering and clapping like, Oh yeah, we love crouch. Let's go. And then the Cooper one, it was like a totally different vibe. Everyone was like crying and sad. It was a more like sad thing. And it's specifically the line where Cooper says that, um, you know, uh, I have been waiting two years to make this video. You know, I kept this going with a couple other people specifically to do this. And so many of you got to play because we did this, you know, and that's like the real, that's like part of the thesis statement of it for me was that, um, Without that, without these other people doing this, all these other people wouldn't have met. They wouldn't be friends. Some of them wouldn't be, you know, lovers now, et cetera, et cetera. Like all this happened specifically because like some people wanted to keep it going and um, wanted to make a community out of it. And uh, so, yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like I, I did exactly what I said I would and I feel very proud of it. It's awesome. Yeah, it's... I think I've mentioned this before on, on the podcast and stuff like, uh, I think one of the things I think is really cool about all stars and what you did was that it was very like unique, like you made it, um, you, you edited the season in the way that you wanted to tell the story. And, uh, 
that meant like be experimenting and doing your own thing at different times. And like, uh, you know, I think that makes it stick out among everything else that's out there. Cause you, you really made your, your own distinct take on like what calls survivor is and like how, what all stars was and how, how it's, the story is told. Um, and you weren't, you didn't necessarily like, you know, make yourself boxed in by the ideas of what CBS survivor is or how the story is told in that way. And like, you, you know, drew inspiration from CBS survivor but also like made it into, and also, you know, past call survivors, but made it into your own thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, yes, yeah, especially with all stars, that was something I'd always had in mind. You know, I wanted to do like to be continued at the end of every episode. And always, I always had it in my head that the last, the penultimate episode would end on a shot of like, you know, the statue hyping up. This is going to be, we're going back to the original final challenge and then it would be to be concluded. Cause there's just something like, there, there's something about that I really like. They did that in the Back to the Future movies. That's where I got the idea from. So in Back to the yeah. Future, the end of the first one says to be continued and the end of the second one says to be concluded. And there's something so definite about that, so definitive. Like, I'm like obsessed with endings. Um, if you couldn't tell from All Stars, like basically, like I think that um, I had a column when I was at Michigan in the Michigan Student Newspaper, the Michigan Daily, that was... Um, all about the whole column was about like endings and i have this whole theory that or not my theory but i think that the ending it defines the meaning of the story so if your story doesn't have an end it doesn't have a point basically um and that's an issue i have with a lot of modern day media you know with like the mcu or like star wars or stuff that like they're not allowing it to end and that's kind of taking away like mm -hmm. the point you you like the moral of the story is always at the end you know um yeah and that's like really what gives the story its power it's not it can't just go on forever. You know, everything ends at some point, right? The sun right. sets and like everybody dies at some point and every story has an end. And so it felt like, um, uh, what am I talking about? Yeah. I don't know. I thought a lot about that going into all stars about like, what is the point of this story and not just like the finale, but the whole season as an ending, what is the point of this story? And the point of the story to me was that this is a story about a community being born. Like in season one, none of these people really know each other. There's like a couple people, but mostly they don't know each other. And by the end, it becomes so interconnected that you're seeing all of these problems with like production is bleeding into the game and the game is bleeding into life and people are dating and people are best friends and people are dating people on production. And it's like the line between the game. There is no line anymore between the game, reality and anything at all. True. And, uh, and so I was like, the point of all of this was really just that they, that this community got got born got created and we've watched it over five seasons this is like a documentary about that yeah and honestly it's helped create other communities as well like i know some other college survivors that have started because of it which is crazy it's really cool yeah yeah i hear from people all the time that like survivor michigan inspired them to make their own college survivor and et cetera yeah. et cetera just like we were inspired by survivor maryland it's like a mm -hmm. passing of the baton you know um uh, somebody else will be inspired by us and they'll be in, someone else will be inspired by them and it'll go on and yeah. on forever. And that's very cool forever. to think about. No, I really like what you said about how the the ending like defines what the story is. It, you know, because I've, it makes sense to me given that like in the end I win. So it kind of depends <laughs> how all along. You know, it really, it really comes full circle that like Sam from the very start was the best one and that's why you know, an <laughs> well i've but i always said that one of the main storylines of all stars was these competing philosophies between cooper and leia and who is correct and the answer is neither of them the answer is somebody in the middle you know somebody in the middle of somebody who's flexible somebody who takes a little bit of leia's philosophy and a little bit of cooper's you know um and it's not it, yeah like both of them were wrong both of them were too stingy and too stagnant and that's not to say they're wrong in every season but in every season of survivor is different for this season the right way to play was something in the middle of those two ideas um and so i think that it makes sense that sam won because he was the person who straddled that line and the bet i think the key thing is in the end of the game i said this elsewhere the end of the game both cooper and leia believe that sam agrees with their view of the game and that I think was the, the best, one of the better moves you made it's not like a move per se but it the fact that you were able to have both of these people who had such opposed ideologies 100% believe that you agreed with their view 
And that ultimately like really helped you win. It kept Cooper wanting to work with you and it kept Leia knowing you would never turn on her. It got you all the way to the end and it got Cooper to like vouch for you on the jury. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was about, it's, yeah, it was like, I think it was, I probably didn't think about it the same way that, you, that you're like articulating it here as much as I was like, I need both of them to think I'm on their side in general. But I mean, in, in, in all seriousness, like I definitely feel like one of the things that's, that's cool about how you've edited all stars and in general, the other seasons is like, yes, it's a story about, you know, who wins and how the winner wins, but it's also like a, there's a larger story that's being told too. You know, it's like, it's really a large, the, the, the true story is about like this community and what happened to these people that were like friends in, in college and were doing college at Michigan while also playing this game. And like, you know, season four, you see it's the story about how Dale wins, but it's also about Shannon and her. Right. It's not, world. yeah. There's a lot of things. It's about multiple things at the same time. There's like not oh, just yeah. one simple story, you know. It's There's not just. Stories. Yeah. Every, it's about so many different things. It's about loyalty. It's about like, uh, it's, it's really about how do people play this kind of fucked up game when they have these real relationships you know, and in many different ways, they have them like Megan and Jackson are dating. You have it's like, where's the line? Megan, like, is the line of the game? Like, what what is what is fair and what's not fair in this sort of game? And does anything go? Because if anything goes, is it morally acceptable for Megan to be lying about her relationship for months ahead of time and have fake discussions about a breakup? Like, I can imagine if I was in that scenario, I'd be very upset with Megan when if I found out that she like if i had a real heart to heart with her about some kind of breakup that would like i've had those conversations with people and to find out that's fake that's like a very violating thing you know um so it's like yeah this is that's one of the cool things about call survivor i think like i feel like with cbs you know we're on season 44 now season 44 is done it's kind of like you we've kind of like Obviously, they add twists and different things to it, but we've kind of seen that format a, a bunch of times now. But College Survivor introduces all these like other elements to it of like people that that are you know you don't see in CBS Survivor. So to me, it feels like there's still a lot of kind of innovation and like the thing I always loved about CBS Survivor these like kind of moral debates about like what is right and wrong within the context of the game and a lot of those have been kind of like worked through and like understood over the years. And it's kind of like reached a point where people more or less agree. But when it comes to call survivor, now suddenly like there's all these other things that are thrown into it. Like, you know, we have pre like lying, like having a fake relationship or about um, like screenshotting things and sending them to people or about like people being friends beforehand. And like, how do you treat that? Like, so I think that the interesting thing about call survivors as in these other elements that aren't, they haven't really been seen before and now there's like these moral debates about these things and i know that people like some fans didn't like the whole moral debates like oh like leia's like whatever uh hypocritical or leia's like, list leia's list but it, it's you gotta say admit that at least it's interesting because these these questions haven't really been discussed like in the same way before because it's a different call survivor is a different thing yeah, no, I agree. I think that that's what made also so fascinating to me was that there were all these kinds of questions being brought up about things that I'd never seen before. And, you know, um, so many, so much of the dynamics was something that I've never seen before, you know? And uh, I, th I found that fascinating. I think that it's endlessly fascinating because there isn't really a right or a wrong, you know? Like Leia could be right or Cooper could be right. It just depends on your point of view, you know? Like there's a part of me that thinks, yeah, in a game, anything goes and we all agree to this and we know, but there's another part of me that says, you know, especially I can say this now that like I've played that it's open that I played survivor. I understand from watching it, editing it and having played it, that it isn't a game when you're playing it, it feels like life and death. It doesn't feel like a game. So it can't just be, you can't just Leia says this is very early on in her thesis. Like it can't just the answer of, Oh, it's just a game can't really be used because it really isn't. It doesn't feel that way, even though it, intellectually you can say that but emotionally it doesn't feel that way to like 95 percent of the people playing it except for maybe like jackson or cooper but even then like when cooper loses a game i don't see him cry you know i see him lose well, games all the even time jackson, even jackson says like in one of the early confessionals in all stars he, matthew asked him if he would vote off be willing to vote off megan at the end if it think if he seems right and that, i'm like, gonna say i'm not gonna speak for him but i don't think he would have yeah he's kind of like uh i don't know i don't know if it'd be worth it like 
you know, the, we could very well have seen a version of the season where they get to the end and now like, and Jackson loses because he, you know, is not willing to, I, you know. I don't know if Jackson would have been willing to vote off Megan. We'll, we'll never I know, know, I guess, but I don't think he would have been. But it doesn't, I, yeah, I mean, at the beginning of the season, it doesn't sound like he would. He's like, oh, that'd be a tough one. I I don't know if I'd be able to like, uh, you know, to do, to do that one. Like, it kind of sounds like he's he wouldn't do it. It's because to take, it's what Leia says near the end. She says like knowing that doing this is taking something so important away from somebody you care about, that's where it becomes really fucked up and twisted. That's where it's like yeah. me doing this thing is I like, I know that this is Cooper's number one thing in college that Cooper has been waiting years and years for this moment. And so it's like to take that, to act to be spending all of my time trying to take that away from him. It's, it's a very wild, emotionally damaging whole situation. And another thing that's so different than like what you see on, like where your traditional survivor is that like, there's no million dollar prize. Like you're not performing in front of, um, you know, like millions and millions of people. So it's like the stakes. It, 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 I mean, even though the stakes feel like the most important thing in the world while you're playing, like you kind of inherently know that this, that if you lose or whatever, like, it's not like, it's not that the stakes aren't as high. So like if you, so the million it's because the million dollars isn't kind of dangled in front of you. I think that also can lead to people making like, different decisions because it's kind of like the friendships are weighted a little more and then the the money at the end is like weighted a lot less so like even though you want the glory of winning and of like competition it's also like i, I don't know I, it's also just not it's kind of like a little bit more balanced where now there's like a real question about like what actually does mean more like this title and this win or like kind of these relationships or, you know whether it should even those things should be connected in the first place yeah, the the removing the money aspect does change it dramatically. It makes it about solely how much do people care about it, you know, and that they want to win. Um, yeah, it was fascinating. It was a fascinating story to explore. It was a fascinating story to tell. And um, I'm very happy and great grateful that I got the opportunity to do it. So you got a lot of questions from... Uh the fans, just like uh, they asked the finalists questions. There's some questions for Ian. And uh, the first one here uh, is talking about the music. They said the music was really great. What was your process for finding and choosing themes throughout the season? Yeah, so music is really, really important to me. And it was more, it got more important to me as the seasons went on. And for All Stars, I had, so for season four, Dale and Shannon each got like their own theme music. Shannon's was, um, uh, the Tortuga song from Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. And Dale's was from Blazing Saddles. And they had these theme musics that like came up a few different times. And Shannon's actually continues on. It's the same music that gets played when we have the, sh the like idol recap with Shannon in All-Stars. Um, for All-Stars, I wanted everybody to have their own theme music. And pretty much every single person in the season has their own theme music um, some of them might be like harder to see than others. Some of them are like more obvious, you know, like, uh, what's the one is, like Tom has the, the flight of the Valkyries, which is actually what he had himself played in his audition tape. So it just seemed like a natural thing and it just fit. They would pick music that fit the person and their character and like their role in the season. And one of the earlier ones I had was, um, I had the last rights music, the music that plays when Cooper gets voted off. I had that picked out like so long ago so so many years ago um and also crouch the crouch had his own little like kind of jingle that comes in each time um different mm -hmm. people had different had different theme musics everybody had one bailey had the west wing theme um emily b had uh barricades from attack on titan and the emily b one was one of the earlier ones also because i really i had i actually edited that tribal was i think the first or second tribal i edited it was the mm -hmm. emily b tribal because I had the music picked out forever and ever that that was going to be the music because the lyrics for that just fit so perfectly for me with what's happening in that moment. It's like, um, I think about the price of our soul, you know, and it's like, as we're doing this thing and voting off Emily B it, it what's this going to do? Well, it ends up destroying Cooper's game. You know, it, it blows up the game and leads to all this crazy shit happening. Um, and so uh, yeah. there's a bunch of different versions of the barricade song. If you go back through an Emily B confessionals all through the season, all the way back in episode one, that song is playing under her confessionals. So there's a lot of different stuff like that, that you could go back. If you watch it, Megan and Jackson had their own theme music. The all-stars theme. The all theme was the first was 
that I discovered, I always wanted to have a theme for all stars, like, like the force theme from star Wars, you know, or Hedwig's theme mm-hmm. from Harry Potter and uh, the music. I found this music that plays at the very beginning of the very first episode, the very, very beginning. It's just like, do, 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 do. That's like a bad version of it, but pretty much that's what it is. And that comes out in every single episode. There's like an actiony version of it. There's um, like a sadder version of it. And it, it became more and more prevalent throughout the merge, but it's in every single episode, usually in moments of people discussing things that are outside the game, impacting inside the game. So that, which is like the main theme of the season. So usually if it's people talking like their friendships or, uh, or it's like just a key alliance being formed. Like it plays under Sam and Adam talking for the first time, I think. And there's some other examples of that. Whenever Leia's talking about Leia's list, it usually comes up. It kind of duels as like a Leia theme, honestly, in a lot of ways. And uh, there's an action version that you see a few different times. It's the, also the music that's playing during the final challenge at the end when it's flashing between all the different challenges. Um, and that, yeah, that music was from the... Uh, 2007 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. So a lot of what I would do is find good soundtracks from kind of obscure places that people wouldn't recognize. So like sometimes I'm like in the trailers, I had a bunch of Star Wars and Stranger Things music and that's fine, but I didn't want the main All-Stars theme to be something really recognizable. I wanted it to be something that you yeah. probably weren't familiar with. Um, uh, Akshay had a good one too. Akshay's theme is actually like the music from the uh, from a section of uh, a bio- one of the Bionicle video games, <laughs> basically, and it's from it's the section of the the Water Tribe in that video game. Okay, so Akshay's yeah, theme yeah. is like the Pawnee theme, basically, because they are the Water Tribe, and he came up with that name. So, and that starts off as his music, and then it later reappears every time there's like a big Pawnee scene. So, in a lot of meetings between Sam and Megan, or Megan and Adam later on in the show, we'll go back to that Pawnee theme. Uh, because that's like uh it's representative of them in some way so the music was very important to me i thought a lot about the music all the time um and uh very intentional yeah it's all the music was very very intentional and if you i could find my list somewhere of all the different theme musics but everybody has one in the end everybody got one for a little while i wasn't sure i thought maybe not everyone was going to get one because i couldn't find music that spoke to each person but eventually i i did and all 21 people got their own music. Can we expect like a all stars or survivor mission, like gen one soundtrack one day? I would love to do that. That's on my list of things to do. I would love to release a, a soundtrack with like, it would have the track name of what I'm calling it. And then also what the actual song is. It would have both of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, cause I'd love, I, I've actually have sort of plans for this. I've written out certain songs like uh, for certain things and, yeah, I think a soundtrack would be really fun to release at some point. I don't know how, but I would release it somehow. It'd be fun. You can, you can make like a... Like a playlist, like a on, Spotify playlist. Yeah, Spotify playlist. Put in the Keep Your Torch Lit Spotify uh, playlist or something. You yeah. Do it. Maybe make a, find the YouTube ones and upload them as MP3s into the... I don't know. You can figure it out. Um. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, that's one of the things that like... I think the All Stars has a lot of rewatch value because of the things like paying attention to the theme and like to the music and like all these little things that um, I think that because of just how much you, content you see at watching it for the first time and they're just even just trying to understand like who are the characters and what are they doing and, and a rewatch is where you can really notice things like that like the foreshadowing and like the music and even like how the music is communicating a part of the story. Yeah, I would th- hope that. I think it would have a ton of rewatch value. Like so many, there's so many little seeds for things. Like every time you see the brioche Chiron mm-hmm. it has such a different impact when you know how that all ends. When you know that it goes from like the Brie to brioche to Brianna, like these three different like aspects of Brie that we yeah. get in the finale. Um, and there's a lot of stuff like that. Like there's a lot of eighth place foreshadowing for Megan. I was honestly mm-hmm. surprised that I think people just didn't want to see it. But I thought there was a lot of pretty telegraph stuff that Megan was going to go home in eighth place um, or that somebody from Pawnee was going to. It seemed like well, that had been pretty well established. Yeah. That's one of the thing I, things I think was brilliant about it, though, is that there was a lot of foreshadowing that somebody from Pawnee would get eighth place. And it kind of ended up by the time we get to the final eight that the three names out there are myself, Megan and, uh, and AJ. So, like. Those are those are literally the three names that were written down at that tribal council. Yeah, for the yeah. <laughs> so, really, really remaining. so 
it was kind of all leading towards one of us. And honestly, the way that you could see the season, even getting into that episode, you could have reasonably seen any of us going. Yeah, out, so. I think you could have. I totally could see that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think it was cool. One of the quotes was... I really liked from that episode was, and I didn't even realize that I said this, but watching it back at the challenge, you, I think Brady asks like, um, you know, Sam, you're the only one that's done the uh, loved ones challenge twice. And I was like, yeah, like last time I was a final eight and I like got voted off. Like, you know, the loved ones challenge either propels you to get voted off in eighth place or like all the way to the victory in the end. And it's like, that's kind of the two different scenarios that, that happened that both had, had literally had happened to me in those two seasons. And also like, that's kind of the, of the Pawnee people, one of us was destined to kind of repeat that eighth place again. It was like, was it going to be me or is it going to be Megan? So I thought that was yeah. some interesting foreshadowing. 100%. There's some really good foreshadowing. I'd have to like, I try, I don't know what my favorite one is, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good ones. I think a lot of really good ones. So I would definitely recommend a rewatch at some point. I think it's a really rewatchable season. I think there's like more and more you can always dig into with different characters' stories. Will and Kevin have a lot of really funny scenes in the rewatch, you know, like in their very first meeting, they shake yeah. hands and Kevin says, hope this works out. <laughs> hope this works out. <laughs> hope this works out. <laughs> Kevin's saying like, I'm going to be a different player this time. Like, yeah. he, he's like new Kevin. He says in the first, very first episode, the first line, the characters are the most dangerous are the ones who have learned from their past mistakes. Right. Oh, that's another thing. Uh, another thematic thing for me was that pretty much another like thing I thought about was that everybody repeats, the, the history repeats itself. The, the scene in the finale where it cuts between the season one final four with Mitch and the season four final four with Shannon and the season five final four. It was also something that I'd had in my head for a really long time. And when I was editing season four, the finale, I was already thinking about the specific flashbacks I was choosing. I wanted to then be able to do have those same ones in All-Stars along with some flashbacks from season four and really tie it all together as this through line that this keeps happening at final four. And when Will says uh, his line about um, survivor players don't change, it's just the same stories told over and over and over again. That was, to me, a really important part of his story and everybody's storyline. So the thing for me was that in the opening credits, we see something from the previous season and then All-Stars. And to me, the a key thing was this was always the thing that had haunted the player or something that it was like a, something from their past that was still haunting them or was the reason they lost their original season. But all of them also were foreshadowing for what happens to them on All-Stars in a lot of cases. So, for so example jesse's is her saying like a clue to what you know and then in all stars she finds this she spends tons of time looking for this fake idol or another example would be jackson i have no morals in all stars he gets screwed over by somebody else having no morals you know and like you know leaking all this stuff about his game exactly megan oh like sweet and innocent and non-threatening well in all stars she becomes this nobody sees her as sweet or innocent at all you know they later on they see her as this whole like mess basically um and there's tons and tons of examples of that. Crouch and Breeze were like specifically called out in the finale. Everybody else's, you can go through them and like figure out what most of them were. But the one person it's different for was again the winner. The winner, Sam, his very first confessional is that about how he wants to play different from season two. And season two, him and Jack and Sarah Z, you guys, you keep your torchlight group, uh, all turned on each other and they all lost. And he wants to not do that this time. And you pretty much stick to it. You go to the end with Bree and Leia, you stick with your alliance, and don't turn on them. And so on a thematic level, the other the other thing was the winner was the person who learned the most from their mistakes, and everybody else fell into the same trap again. Kevin pretty much plays it. The, the Will blindside is like a redo of the Daniel blindside, but actually much worse. Um, and there's a lot of examples of that throughout the season. So that was an important thing for me thematically also that I thought a lot about. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's almost like uh, if you're going through and rewatching, you had to like take notes on all these things because you could literally, I feel like there's like 10 different, you know, kind of threads you could follow for every single episode on like this person's storyline, their music, their foreshadowing, but also like how did their past performance get repeated this time? And like, it's a, it's interesting too. you say like, you know, as, as, for, as far as my character was like, I learned from some of my mistakes, but you also see me fall into some of the same mistakes as well. Like the, uh, in season two, I accidentally like tell I, I like don't know who was on the phone. I tell Abby like, "Oh, it'll be the five of us and Abby." And I thought that she was somebody else, and like kind of exposed that she was in the outside of the alliance. Like this time, I exposed 
the first episode, like uh, that kind of, you know, that I was thinking of voting off Adam, like, it's kind of funny. You see also like, you know, I think it's because these are the same people ultimately like time has passed, but people are the right. same people. You see the same personality traits, but also people's strategies. Sometimes they either they change or they, yeah, they don't. I mean, people or don't, I don't think people, some people do change, but in a lot of ways, people don't change, you know, and they mm -hmm. just, they are the same. So. And some people want to change too. They like, it's like one of the tragedies I think of, of Ben and Will is that they both want to, change and like become play differently than they did first time and then they end up being like uh they both end up being like basically stabbed in the back uh after like you know they both had their alliance in season three like they both kind of like be, whatever went against each other they got bet will got betrayed by ben but like they kind of both betray each other and then they both like go come back like i'm gonna be loyal this time and then they both get betrayed by like somebody else and uh and end up being their undoing and both the returning seasons like it's kind of a tragic story of like i want to change for my first time but like you know you just weren't allowed to basically yeah yeah will and ben have like parallel storylines basically which was really cool so uh here's a good one kind of talking on the a note of all this like kind of the foreshadowing and stuff like that if you had known the outcome of all stars before editing season two what if anything? What have you? What do you have done differently in season two's edit? Um, that's interesting. I think that I would have emphasized. Um, I think I would have emphasized you betraying Sam and Sarah more. Like I'm, I'm sure it was like a big deal, but I think it. I would have emphasized it even more as like this really, really big deal that you guys were go that you guys were turning on each other because it's such an explicitly thing. But honestly, most of the other stuff, like I feel like Kevin and Bailey was pretty well set up in season two for what happens to them in All Stars. And I think that uh Nick's storyline was was pretty well set up. Like I I I think I might try to give Bree some more screen time in season two if I could. If I could go back. I wish I could give Bree more screen time in All Stars also. She's give like, her up, Bri Briash uh, and yes. Brianna. That's and that's Kyra. one thing I well, I would if I was editing the entire thing now. I, I'm like a, I love like, you know, um, uh, what's continuity, right? And so I would go back and like have Brioche Chirons in season two. I would have all this theme music I said for everybody that would like carry on yeah. throughout. Everybody would have it in all the seasons. It wouldn't just be an all-stars thing. Um, I uh, would have Megan Missiles coming up in season oh, four, yeah. stuff yeah. like that. I would do all that kind of stuff basically. So like, I would do that. There's a lot of stuff like that that I would do. I think I would go back and do stuff like that. But honestly, there's not that much that I would really, really change. All right, we're back. I uh, had to take a quick break to because some stuff came up. Um, but here we are, recording the second half of the podcast here. A little How's it going? Scene. Good to be back. Sorry about that little uh, break in your podcast feed, but you know. Some important business had to be taken care of, and now we're back in action. Yep, yep. If you're listening, then you probably have not noticed, except for, you know, us mentioning it right now. But if you're watching on YouTube, you see we had a little outfit change. Very cool. So, <laughs> little intermission, little chance for you to go, you know, take a break, gather your thoughts while you uh, engage in the rest of this, you know, really fulfilling and fascinating interview. Of course. So we're talking through some all-stars, uh, going through the questions. And uh, next question I got for you is, were you surprised at the reception any players got from the viewers? Was I surprised at any of the reception the players got? Uh, yes. Yeah, I was. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was surprised that people, that Megan was a fan favorite, but I was surprised that she somehow – at times it felt like became like the only fan favorite that really surprised me. I thought that the cast was um, uh, such a diverse array of like personalities that I thought that like, there would be lots of different people who had stands. And I think I might just underestimated in today's day and age of like internet culture. Like it's always going to become an echo chamber and people always are going to just like stand like very specific people. But I kind of assumed that I, I thought um, Adam AJ would have much more, much more stands than they seem to have. 
uh, especially after they shave their head and flip the entire game. I thought that that would be a, a couple episode stretch where the AJ stands really, really come out and uh, are just rooting for them the rest of the way. And that like didn't really happen. Um, I will say that I think I, I predicted Leia almost, almost completely correct. I said that people were going to hate Leia, but that by the end, they would there would be a lot of people kind of rooting for her and that they would slowly get Stockholm syndrome into almost rooting for her at the end. And that that did happen. There was a lot of people in the comments saying like, oh, I thought Leia should have won. You know, uh, she played the best game and I don't like her game, but she played the best game. So I called her correctly. I think all of us also thought Cooper would be more of a villain than people saw him as. I think that a lot of the people on the jury production and the cast always saw Cooper as like a villainous figure um, this season. But a lot of the fans seem to, you know, root for Cooper and see him as more of a hero. So those would be the ones that surprised me the most. In general, I just expected that there would be a more wide range of opinions. I didn't ex- I-, I thought it was going to be like because like the season itself was sort of controversial. I thought that it would be a real divide of opinions. I didn't think that it would be so stagnant that most the vast majority of people were like, fans of megan you know i thought there'd be some megan fans some sarah fans some kevin fans some cooper fans some bailey fans etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah that makes sense um kind of on that note uh about fan reception so seeing the fan reception now would you have edited anything differently did you expect the public consensus to shift after the dark era of the early merge um i would not have edited it any differently i was surprised that some corners of the internet found the season uh to be less enjoyable than i i thought it would be um cooper and i sat around about a week before the season premiered and i was sitting on our couch and i was just kind of like dude i'm really nervous like what if, what if people don't like it you know and he was like bro people are people are gonna love it like they love season four and that's the bad season like they're gonna this is like survivor cocaine, you know, like this is, this is anything anyone would ever want for a survivor season, basically. Like how could they not love it basically? And I was like, you're right, you're right, you're right. And I definitely knew that there would be a a slow stretch in the early merge, but I didn't see it as any different than the slow stretches in every other season of survivor Michigan. Like I think the early merge of pretty much all five seasons is pretty similar. Like a group comes together, they stick together for a couple votes, then they blow up. That happens in literally every single season of survivor Michigan season one through five. So um, the reception in, again, in certain places, you know, I, I think that there's also an echo chamber aspect. We got tons and tons of comments, uh, mostly in like the post episode polls where I think people were more comfortable saying it, that like they loved the season and the season was amazing and all kinds of stuff like that. So it wasn't like there was only people that were found the merge to be unfulfilling, but I definitely underestimated how much people would, hate the majority alliance you know i think that i saw it as i didn't see them as as wholly unlikable as a lot of people felt they were Be- because i think that i don't find people just shitting on each other to be automatically unlikable like there's likability and there's like do i like them as characters which is two different kinds of things you know like to me it's like kevin is not a likable character in the sense that he's being a dick to everybody the whole time but he is a likable character in the sense that I like watching him because he's good TV. And that's kind of what I thought it was more so. Like, I don't think any, I didn't really think that, I don't know. I think that I just felt that all the people were three dimensional and they were all heroes and all villains in different people's eyes. So I didn't think it was going to be seen as such a black and white thing as some people saw it as, but I wouldn't change anything about it because I told the story that I wanted to tell. And I do think that people, a lot of people came around by the end. And I do think that a lot of the, more hyperbolic reactions were somewhat overblown and that with time people look back at it and feel differently. Um, because in the moment when you're watching something like a good example is succession spoilers. If you haven't seen the succession finale, I had a real knee jerk reaction to the succession finale. Uh, the person who ended up becoming CEO, I didn't feel like the story had properly set that up and I didn't really like it. But like, even with like two days time already coming around to thinking like, you know, that that actually really did make sense. And that was like a good ending for the show. Uh, I mean, I mostly love the ending, but there was a specific thing that happened. That I was like, oh, that doesn't feel right. It feels like it would have been better for it to have been somebody else, maybe. Um, but that's because I had my own, like, you know, version of what I wanted the ending to be. And if you have that locked in, you it can be hard to get around to what the actual story is. So I think that once people, now they know the whole story of All-Stars, you can go back and just appreciate the journey a lot more. 
than worrying about, you know, in my idealized season where, you know, Megan wins or something like that. Uh, now that you know that doesn't happen, it can be easier for you to watch it probably. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the stories just like are much more satisfying uh, after you know what happens and can kind of see like the setup all along and kind of how like, you know, for all these characters, uh, I don't know, there is there's like lead up and there's foreshadowing. You can kind of see like how their arc, uh, you know, starts and, and starts and you can see the middle and you can see the end and it all kind of like, it all kind of fits, you know? Yeah. I mean, but, I won't pretend it wasn't, it wasn't hard. Like it was really hard, you know, the stretch yeah. in the middle there from probably episodes about like seven, probably about episodes seven through 11, like from the cliffhanger episode, the ending of that through to episode 11, it was like a tough stretch emotionally because I still was spending every single day editing every single day working on it. And at times it was like, well, people don't even like it. Like, why am I, you know, spending all of my time, dedicating all of my time to this? And it felt kind of crushing that, like, this thing I had spent years and years on, it was disappointing, like, the the hardcore fans, the people who, like, loved it the most. Because those are the people you want to love it the most. Yeah. Um, but eventually I was just like, you know, it's also an outspoken uh, vocal minority, you know? Like, these episodes are getting thousands of views. And the most comments we ever see is like a hundred comments on YouTube, 200 comments maybe. And like, if an episode got like four or 5,000 views, that's like a fraction of the people. And even like the discord, et cetera, there's probably lots of people who I, there were tons of people who watched the show who I knew. And I would like say, Oh, people don't like it as much as I thought they would have. Like, what do you mean, man? It's been great. What are you talking about? Yeah. Like, I don't even know what you're talking. There's so many people who watched it who don't read those comments. Don't look at the YouTube channel, the YouTube live stream and stuff. And like when I thought about it, I was like, I when I've never commented on a YouTube video. Like every YouTube video I've ever watched, I don't comment on. So there's probably the and the fact I know that for a fact that lots of people did like it because they kept watching. You know, yeah. like if they really, really disliked it, they would just quit watching. And up till the very end, we had pretty much like a pretty loyal contingent of viewers, and the episodes all did very well. Um they had about the same percentage of drop off as every other season of Survivor Michigan, but they started at a higher point. So they, uh, it ended up doing very, very well. So I was pretty happy with it in the end. And I do think the last couple episodes like brought home, uh, most people were fairly satisfied with them. I think. Definitely. Yeah. I think it's just the thing about like, if you, it's so much, if you have something like really negative to say, it's easy to say it and kind of like hate comment on something. But if you like something, it's much more likely that you're just going to like, whatever, like, like watch it or like, like the video or like subscribe to the channel. If you're not going to be like, oh, like this was great. Like it's just less, less common, you know, if you're, it's why like, you go on Twitter. Most of the tweets are going to be negative because it's just easier to say something that's negative And that's what like people are going to like, that's what people are going to interact with because it's like, it's catches your attention, I guess. And it's kind of like, if you have something negative to say, you'll say it. If you have something positive to say, people don't say it as much. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was a it was a learning experience. It was a growing experience. But no, I wouldn't change anything because I believed in the story at the end of the day. It wasn't some kind of... There were some people I saw on Discord who at various times accused me of like lying or like, why did you guys say the season was good if it was bad? It's like, I believed it was everything that I said it was. I believed in the story and I believed that you'll never see another season of Survivor quite like this. And I stand by that. And I don't think that you will ever see a season of Survivor again that gives the level of credence to every single character and has interesting stories for each person and has this dynamic of a situation just in general. I think yeah. like you can only be furious about something that you're like really deeply love at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. like, people are only are mad at the ending of game of Thrones because they love the rest of the show so much. And so it was impressive to me also that like from a production standpoint, Megan was such a like um, nobody character, you know, she almost didn't get cast in the season. If she wasn't dating Jackson, I don't know if Megan would have even been cast in all stars because production thought so lowly of season four and only really the editing team, like, saw the potential for season four and the fans obviously loved season four and then loved those players on all stars. And I think it's a testament to the story we told that even uh, that people that like Megan, who most of the cast dismissed as not a significant factor was such a fan favorite on the show. Cause we easily could have just told the story that certain members of the cast saw, you know, and they wouldn't have been a significant factor. Yeah. On the, uh, 
kind of on this topic, another question says, has the reception to the season and your experience editing changed your view on CBS Survivor? Uh, yes, I would say that I understand now why CBS does certain things the way that they do. And I would say old CBS also, because the new CBS seasons are also edited in kind of a different way. But one of my complaints about CBS was always that I don't like I don't like the winner edit. I don't believe in the winner edit. I don't like the idea that the story only revolves around this one person who won. And therefore, we need to like twist or degrade other people's stories to like prop up that person. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me because there's like so many more people in the season. And it doesn't make sense to me that like a season's bad if I don't like the winner. That's like, oh, so there's one episode I don't like. But if I enjoyed the other 15 episodes then that's a good season to me. Like a good season to me is if I enjoyed watching it and had a good time watching it, you know? Um, But I understand now more why CBS like has leaned into like, you know, the winner edit or they really want people to like the winner and they'll edit things certain ways to make that happen. Because I do think that people, that's the story people want to see. They want to see a hero triumph over the villain. They want to see a simple story of like black and white, good versus evil. I do think that that's, what people inherently want out of a story. And so um, by All-Stars very nature, I didn't set out to tell that kind of story. So uh, I understand more why CBS does do it the way they do now, because they're doing something for an extremely broad-based audience, and they just want the vast majority of people to come away from it, you know, feeling good about it. They don't want people to come away from it feeling like someone they didn't like win. Right. They want people to come away from there. there, It's a product. They need you to watch the next season. They want you to tell your friends to watch it. So they don't they're not as interested in like people have said all stars is kind of like a documentary. Like, yeah, that's sort of true. You know, like I at the end of the day, as much as, you know, obviously season six is fucking fantastic. I hope you watch it. It's the best season of Survivor Michigan ever, obviously, because I'm on it. So Mm -hmm. you should obviously watch it. And season seven, eight and so on and so on. I've heard are amazing. But the goal of all stars wasn't to get you to watch the next season, which I think the goal of CBS survivor is to get you to watch the yeah. next season. It's interesting because like, when you think about it, like CBS, like even this in the question itself, like, Oh, like what is CBS survivor editing? Like, you know, it's changed a lot over the years. And when I think about how survivor started, like season one, Borneo, like, was a lot more similar to what you're describing where like it was much more like a documentary of just like here's these people and what happened to them while they were living in the wilderness and like richard hash the first winner like he's not a winner that like you come away from being like wow like i feel so good that richard won like he was kind of like a villain he was kind of like mean to people and like the he literally wins the game because he was like the most ruthless essentially and that's what the whole snakes and rats speech is about and like that's kind of how survivor started and i feel like the way all stars was edited is more similar to like the very early seasons of survivor and kind of like more of the roots of survivor than like kind of as survivor, you know, continued on and on and made more and more and more seasons and are trying to appeal to a broader audience and kind of like almost get sanitized in some sense. Like it, it, I feel like that changed, but if you think back to like what it originally was, I feel like it is kind of more similar to what you're describing. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense to me. And I think that um, uh, the story I was interested in telling was specifically like, this is a really crazy messed up thing that happened to these people. And let's show yeah. what it was. And let's show that like college students trying to put on a reality TV show is a really fucking hard thing to do. And it's a really hard thing to maintain any kind of like integrity when everybody is best friends everybody's like dating and sleeping with each other. Everybody's friends with production, like production is sleeping with the cast members. They living with the cast members. Like it's an endlessly messy situation. And um, I wanted to show that I wanted to show how messy it was. It's the story of college students trying to do what they have teams of people doing in real life. You know, like it's honestly crazy that this is a thing that happens. It doesn't like, this is college students in their free time, basically, and like busy with so many other things doing something that in real life is a professional professional people's jobs right like i saw a lot of people were like oh my god like the final immunity why did brady like you know end it basically by making it go to one foot and like not letting them last forever it's like people had exams like brady been up all night you know like everyone else on production had abandoned him i promised him i'd be there all night and i i, I wasn't i gave up and went home 
me and Matthew Israel both gave up. It's like at a certain point, I don't blame him at all for that yeah. um, because he's a human being and the, the game takes its toll on production as well. <laughs> like <laughs> he was also out there all night in like 10 degree temperatures, freezing his ass off. Like something had to give. Something had to give. Um, another question for you is uh, on that like speech you had at the very beginning of the finale. Uh, it says, how much were you choked up in the other takes before you got to the final take you included in the episode? <laughs> uh, well, that was the only, the, the take I included was the only take I was able to successfully get through it. So that was the only like good take that existed. Basically, actually, I filmed that the morning before I flew to Vegas. So this was like a couple hours okay. before I flew to Vegas for the finale because it was the, it was basically like the very last thing I filmed because uh, I've been putting it off because I knew it was going to be a struggle for me to get through it. And uh, I had like written it out, but then like, I didn't even really follow what I had written. And um, I kept trying to get through it. And I kept, sh I kept getting choked up when I was like reading, when I was saying everybody's names. Uh, um, and I had thought, you know, I have some of these things planned out for a really long time. Like I had thought for a really long time that I was going to say, you know, it was going to end by saying like, they're all part of my Leia's list, you know, because for, if you've watched the show, you know what that means, right? Yeah. If you haven't watched the show, you're not a part of it. That doesn't mean anything to you, but if you've watched it, I felt like that's sort of a powerful thing to say. It's a, it's a, it's not, you know, it's not nothing to say someone's on your Leia's list. That's like serious, serious business. It's true. Um, and I do think there's like a level of fondness that I'll have for everybody from all of seasons one through five, but especially from all star season, uh, as a special fondness I'll have for all of them, uh, for the rest of my life. So yeah, that was the only take I was able to get through without like just completely breaking down. So that was, as soon as I got through it once I was like, all right, I'm putting this in. And I kind of wished it had been a little less weepy. I think it was a little, I would have preferred it to be like a little bit less weepy, but I was like, I'm not doing this again. Like, and I, I need, I needed to pack still. Like I was running out of time. I, I couldn't, I yeah. kept trying to do it. I couldn't get through it. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to have a good time to do it in Vegas with everybody around. So it was really, nice. It, it was authentic. Uh, you know, you got through it. It's your one take. That was nice. Um, I have a few questions that are just kind of about like the editing process in general. Uh, first one, very simple. What program do you use to edit? Uh, Adobe Premiere. Adobe Premiere. I've always used Adobe Premiere. I think it's the best editing software available for, you know, general, like, people like us, basically, that you can get easily as a, you know, semi-professional, young professional. So I use Adobe Premiere, and I've always loved Adobe Premiere. One issue I had this season was that Adobe Premiere, they upgraded to a new version and the new version, um, the way that the graphics work was going to be completely retooled and your old graphics cards that you had weren't going to work anymore. And that upset me because all of the Chirons for seasons one through four are very specific. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's actually a slightly different version of the Survivor font used for each season for seasons one through season one and two are actually the same. And then seasons three and four, I actually created my own version of the Survivor font. The slightly, I took the Survivor font and fucked with it a bit and made each one slightly different in a way that I thought fit that that season. And then for All Stars, I was saving like what's kind of the modern version of the Survivor font. I was always saving that to use it for All Stars. So each season was kind of going to have its own font. And so I wanted in the uh, intro sequence before everybody gets sorted into their tribes for All Stars, when their font, when their Chirons are coming up, when we're first getting reintroduced to all the different people, it's their original font from their original season. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to look exactly the same as it did in those seasons. And this is probably something no one would ever notice besides me. But like I said earlier, I'm really a sucker for like continuity and things like that. And I always was trying to think of like, I want to make this the season I would want to see. And like, if I was watching it, what would I want to see? What I want to see is to feel like the editor cares as much about the show as I do. And like, is obsessed with those kind of con canonical details as I am. And I would want them to have the original Chirons because those are the tribes they're on before they got these new tribes. And in the new version of Adobe Premiere, it was going to wipe that out, and I was not going to be able to use the old Chirons. So I actually kept the old version for two years longer than I should have, and it, it might have been more buggy because of that, because I didn't want to lose those old fonts for the previous seasons. And I actually, yeah, so I had I had a folder with everybody's Chiron from seasons one through five because I wasn't sure who I was going to need for cameos also, like in the scavenger, and I couldn't remember who all was yeah, in yeah. it. So I made a new Chiron for every single person. Um, cool. 
And so that was, uh, yeah, that was something that I had to do with Adobe Premiere, but mostly Adobe Premiere is a great software and I highly recommend it for any college survivor editors mm -hmm. out there. It's dope. The attention to detail is, uh, I think a lot more than people probably realize like watching it through the first time. Um, how did you, another question on the editing stuff is how do you begin to approach editing a season with so many hours of footage? And how do you organize all the footage and know what confessionals to use? I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it was an insane amount of work. I kept an editing journal for all stars that I've been editing. I told Sam, we could maybe put it in the link to this kind of like the link to Leia's thesis, but I'll have to finish editing it first because there's some stuff I need to cut out, but it's 245 pages long and over a hundred thousand wow. words. So that's basically that's like, a, that's basically a short novel. Um, yeah. And I kept, I just, a lot of it is like, you know, oh, today I did this and not very interesting, but some of it is pretty interesting. But uh, in that, you know, you see that like, it's a very, very slow process of organizing the footage and people summarizing, you see the whole summary team and, you know, you could probably just use a transcription software to transcribe everything, but I don't think that that captures like the soul of the confessionals necessarily. Like sometimes 10 different people explained the plan, but I need to know which person explained it the funniest way. I didn't know which person explained it in the most coherent way, you know, in the way that it's going to convey it to the audience in the best way. And that sometimes requires watching 10 different people say it or having somebody who's already summarized it, like put a note that says this bit's really funny. So it's a lot, a lot of summary work, a lot of help from Sam and other people who summarized hundreds of hours of footage. And then we have each, every week is organized by person. So like all of Sam's confessionals are in a folder, all of Cooper's confessionals and so on and so on. And then, the way I always try to think about it was just like little bit by little bit. So each episode I break down into what I call sequences, which is basically like a scene. So like a sequence would be Sam decides to uh, flip on Cooper. And then that scene is about Sam flipping on Cooper. And that's like a five minute scene, say that's a sequence. And then the next sequence, the next sequence would be Sam meets with Leia, tells him we're flipping on Cooper. That's its own sequence, you know? And um, so I just build sequence by sequence and I would, any clips I think should, I go through all the footage from that week. I read through all the summaries and I pull out any clips for each sequence I think is important. And sometimes you have to make more sequences along the way. Sometimes you realize the sequences you had aren't quite right. And then I have a temp order for them. And once I have enough sequences together, then I put each sequence into a giant master timeline. And then I start rearranging them or does this piece actually need to go there? Is this piece better here? And slowly and slowly the episode comes together. And uh, after you've done that once, then you have to do it 14 more times for all the other episodes. <laughs> yeah. That's not the first version. The first version is like much, much longer than the, re the real episode. Like you think that the episodes were long. I mean, you should have seen the uh, assembly cuts. Like yeah. Twice. Some of them were like twice as long, I think. I yeah. wonder what the longest one was. Oh, the, the finale rough cut was what? Like four and a half hours at like, one point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Because then it's like each of those sequences goes through iteration process of like, you know, review it, like watch it, look for, should this be shifted around here or there? Is it, you know, can we cut this line? What lines we have to add in? Does everything make sense? And then you do that a few times until you get the final episode. And the summarizing is like, I mean, I don't even know how many, what would we say it was like 250 hours of, was that how many hours of footage it was? I don't even remember how many hours it was. But it was that seems too video. low. That seems too low. But it, more, it was an insane amount of footage, but all, literally every single minute of the footage was all watched and literally transcribed like with timestamps every single minute, even like maybe every 30 seconds of like, so-and-so says this, so-and-so, you know, then this happens. Then Somebody watched every single one of those videos. Yes. And like the really good lines or funny moments are usually put in bold. It's literally they're like there's spreadsheets. That'll be like, obviously episode one, they'll have a different tab for each of the 21 players. And each tab for like, let's say Sam episode one, will have like a, you know, a row for each video, uh, you know, video title in one column, then like description in the next column with like timestamps of everything. Uh, and for literally every video for the entire season, you can like find, you know, realistically, you could go and like find any video from the entire season in these spreadsheets and like exactly which timestamp was this thing said. Uh, so insane amount, a lot of work. It, there was a lot of people that did help with the summarizing over the years for, you know, all the seasons and, and all stars. Uh, I mean, I would say that probably Cooper and myself and, and you, Ian did 
most of it, or at least the largest portion of it. Uh, so it's a lot of watching stuff. But I feel like also it's like watching the videos is really where you're able to find kind of those needles in the haystack. Like that, like if it's all just like transcribed as words, you might not like it might not hit you the same. But like if you're watching an hour long video of like Megan and Jackson, you know, 36 minutes in, you you hear like a line that you realize like, oh, this is like perfect foreshadowing. Like, I can't believe that they said this. And like, that might not have been caught if you just like skimmed through it or didn't summarize it or, you know, transcribed it in some software. So like a lot of it's also the tone, right? Like mm -hmm. um, Megan Jackson is a good example. Like a lot of their meetings are them flirting and like, that's hard yeah. to convey over a transcript, but watching it, you can feel the tension and figure out mm -hmm. what the best moments are to include. Same thing with like jokes or like certain people like yeah. crouch, like you really need to watch all of Crouch's footage to see which parts he's saying are like the funniest or when he gives a goofy pause that, you know, really yeah. adds to the dynamic. That's, that's true. A lot of it isn't even, it isn't always words. Like sometimes it's like, what are people's facial expressions? Like maybe a funny thing is said because there's nothing said or because somebody like, you know, pauses at a certain point and there's an awkward silence, like things like that that you only catch if you actually, if you actually like watch it and like see it. You know? hundred percent. And then like every episode goes through a series of revisions. I mean, each one of these All-Stars episodes had yeah. at least three versions, sometimes more. I mean, the premiere had like six versions. Yeah. Um, and uh, people, everybody gives notes on them. Everybody being Sam Cooper, Mason and Brian um, give notes on them. And then we go, I go back to the drawing board and, you know, cut stuff down and do more editing. And I know everybody thinks that the season was too long. The episodes were too long. But and I won't be able to do this forever because I already can't do it for some of the earlier seasons. But right now, like today, I could you could point to any line in all of All Stars and I can tell you why it was included. Like every single every single line in the entire show was included for some kind of a reason. You might not like the reason, but there is a reason. Like I watched each of these episodes probably like 30 times before they came out, at least for each one. And I would think about every single line. Do we need that line? Can we cut that line? You know, like, cause I was always trying to get them as short as possible. Um, so every single line in the sea is at no point was it out of like, Oh, laziness would just be longer. Every single line in the entire season was put there for a deliberate reason or purpose. And sometimes the reason was just, I thought it was funny. You know, sometimes the reason was that I feel like it closed off some very minor plot line that you might have not even thought was a plot line. But to me in my crazy brain of where there's like so many little things that there's like a good example is the, the fake um, advantage given to Kevin by Jackson. Yeah. Um, that had some dialogue around it in the next couple of episodes, even though it really didn't ever play into much. But to me, that was like a tiny little thread that needed to be closed off somehow, you know, like, there was no way we were going to cut Jackson giving that to Kevin out of the show because it didn't. It would have made no sense to cut that. But it also felt like to include it, we needed to at least have some of Kevin's thought process on it in the next couple episodes. Show how he realizes it doesn't that he that it's fake, and show people slowly saying like, "Oh yeah, Kevin has a thing where we think it's fake." Those are lines that like could be cut from like a CBS season. But to me, it's like that's like a minor plot line that needs to be resolved. Like I wanted to make sure that there was like no unclosed loops that every single little thing was tied up as well as could be tie up all loose ends speaking of a, a loose end that needs to get tied up uh, another question says ian will you ever make and publish the cat cut we need it the cat cuts if you don't know what this is i've joked about a version of season four like an hour-long special in which it's edited such that cat is a genius as a genius uh, schemer masterminding the entire season and cat wins the season um, and just steamrolls everybody basically. And I'm pretty sure the footage exists to like make this happen. And it would be kind of a funny gag. Um, I won't promise when, but like, I think maybe we'll see the cat cut one day, yeah. one day when I'm bored and sitting around, I think that I think I would like to make the cat cut maybe as like an anniversary special for season four at some point. That's so great. no promises when, but I would like to do it at some point in time. And I will finish all of the, um, bonus scenes from all stars and episode zero which i promised those will all be finished and released at some point in time no promises when but they will all come out cool episode zero you want to describe what that is episode zero is an episode that takes place before the season it takes place between seasons four and five and it covers all of the pre-gaming that went on and the irony is like this season got accused of people saying oh it was all just pre-game but the point of episode zero is going to be that pretty much all of the pre-game amounted to absolutely nothing like 
a lot of the pregame alliances, Sam and Aaron, for example, met up and had a meeting where they talked about how loyal they were going to be to each other in the game. We saw how that lasted. And a lot of the heavy pregaming was done by Will and Emily Paddock, you know, who did very well in All-Stars. So their pregaming clearly, like, you know, helped them out so much. Don't forget um, about Tom. Tom. Tom as well. So, like, you know, it would be a chance to go in and, you know, get back some of our favorite characters who we didn't get that much of in All-Stars and include some funny moments. Basically, Tom fighting for his life and pushing the vote on the, the day one vote onto Akshay and seeing how that all came together a little bit and just seeing kind of the craziness that was going on that summer. This is something I wanted to get done released during the actual season, but I ended up similar to the bonus scenes. It ended up becoming more important to me to like make sure that the final set of episodes was like ironed out how I wanted them to be than it was to finish like extraneous bonus content, which at the end of the day, I can finish whenever. That is fun that, you know, if you are, obviously we talk about Gen 2 already and how we're already looking ahead to season six and beyond. So it's fun that, you know, if you do you have a soft spot in your heart for all this uh, fun generation one, season one through five stuff, and you're sad that the content is over, it's not over. There will be more stuff someday. So it'll be kind of fun to, to look back at some point. Yeah, exactly. There will be, it'll be like a little hit of nostalgia, you know? Yeah. We'll get, we'll still, there's still some more Megan and Sarah footage that's great from po post merge. One of my favorite Sarah confessionals didn't make the show. So that'll be in there at some point. I think it's in episode nine, the episode nine bonus content. And, uh, you know, lots of fun stuff. There's a rites of passage. You guys did rites of passage in the finale. And I actually did a cut of rites of passage. I, I edited it, part of it for the finale. And I just cut it for time because it just was like, we don't have time for this. And there's enough rites of passagey things in the finale that I didn't feel like we needed it. Yeah, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. That and you know, if you're if you're watching maybe like in the near future, it probably won't be in the description. But if you're further on in the future, you know, Ian's uh, editing journal will be in the description. You can click on and do that below. Uh, so if it's not there right now, just tune in later. That'll be there. You know, you talked about the uh, soundtrack one day. Um, I know there's some even some stuff that like with KYTL and some fun little bonus content I want to do someday. So like there, you know, we're, we're season five is like chapter has been closed, but you know, there'll, there'll probably be some more stuff someday that, that you guys can see. Definitely. Definitely. So uh, here's a fun question. You'll, you'll love this one, Ian. Um, what is the selection process like for the new editors? P.S. Ian is the best editor of any version of Survivor in my book. Oh, thank you. That's so kind of you. The Sounds selection. Like the succession almost. Of editors. <laughs> yeah, the succession of the new editors. Well, yeah. uh, it's not so much a process as it was who is interested in doing it. You know, some people from Gen 2 reached out to me before All Stars and during season four about being interested in, in you know, continuing it and. So I brought them, those guys, Mason and Brian, on board for All Stars, and they summarized footage and they helped with the, they watched all the rough cuts and gave notes, and me and Sam kind of talked them through the process of how we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And they have um, a new editor for Generation Two, um, named Megan, and Megan has done a wonderful job so far. She did the Gen Two trailer, which is already out on YouTube, and um, so uh, and she's editing seasons seven, eight, nine, and ten. And actually, uh, George from season one is editing season six because he was on season six and he wanted to edit it. So that's what that he's doing that. So you actually know the guy editing season six probably already. You already have a sense of his editing style. Mostly it's people who want to do it and are interested. And I think both of these new editors in George and Megan are fully, fully capable and will do a very, very good job. So I'm very excited to see, uh, you know, what they do, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really like the trailers. I that they put out. It's, it's cool seeing the different styles. Oh, I thought they were great. I thought they were yeah. great. Everyone's their own style and it's cool to see. And also that's like the benefit I think of, you know, we really had like three different editors for season five, six, and seven. So like the work was being done simultaneously on all three seasons at, at certain points. And that's like, you know, one of the things that for one, I, I've been really interested to see the different editing styles. And two is like, it helps uh, ensure that we're not going to have like, you know, year long, years long gaps between these seasons. Yeah. I mean, I think like season six and seven should both come out like in relatively short time frame because yeah. of that. So that's really cool. And that means that, you know, there'll be more, much more Survivor Michigan content. You won't have to wait too long for your next, for your next fix, you know? 
course. Um, last question here uh, is a very long rant. I think that I thought that was a fun question to leave for last. Okay, sounds good. So, I mean, it probably is going to say similar stuff that we've already talked about. I haven't even read it yet, but uh, I'll, I'll do a little, little reading of this uh, of this rant and uh, you can respond to it. So, uh, for for reference, uh, just so you know, everybody listening. Uh, you know, all of these questions were submitted anonymously by uh, just like fans of the show where they were just like kind of submitting any questions that they had for the players, the finalists, Ian, uh, and this specific person, whoever, whoever it was, like may like basically had this like really long rant where they talked about all five of the finalists and like finished with Ian and all of them are just kind of like destroying each finalist and like how much like, hey, like, by the way, like Crouch, like Cooper, Bree, Leia, Sam, like here's why like you're the absolute worst and why you suck so bad. And they finished with Ian. So uh, if you if you listen back to our old podcast, you'll hear uh, for the other interviews. You'll hear this person, these person's rants. They're pretty entertaining uh, for the other finalists. And now we're we're going to hear the the final part of it, which is uh, to you, Ian. So uh, here it is. And now for the biggest villain and flop of the season, Ian. Ian, if it were in my hands, I would easily award you with the best edited Survivor season ever, not just college stuff award. Just because of your creativeness and the threading of all the narratives, as well as showing us a different way of watching Survivor. But all of that came at what cost? Tis, tis. I mean, your perception of the season was obviously biased because you like these people so much. But sorry to tell you, the vast majority of them were very unlikable and not in a good way. And for long periods of time, too. Hearing you praise the season beforehand defend the season and the players on the post episodes all that is fine i'll let it go but bitch if i hear you say the production screw up wasn't that bad one more fucking time i don't know what i will fucking do you even go on to say that it didn't have that much of an impact and this is all impacts now when on the same episode dylan goes home because of it megan and Sam's relationship is fucked and megan's entire game is tanked from here on out now it's lowercase again i also hate it every time you try and criticize megan's game like, bitch, nobody's a Megan Stan for gameplay. Like, we get it. But we don't see you criticizing the Gabon-esque gameplay from the majority of the cast either. So what the fuck? Stop messing with the queen and embrace and praise her for being the only 10 out of 10 aspect of the season. And a lot of your editing decisions are very questionable, like including Abby at all. That was disgusting. The whole Pringles Idol thing. Well, yes, I was surprised to see Andrew really had it. I didn't really get the point of why I was edited that way. Because at that point, he knew and everyone else knew that his idol was legit. So it wasn't a, oh, I'm playing this and we don't know if it's real or not. The longer episodes, while I didn't mind most of them, some definitely need to be cut it down, like egregiously so. But to be honest, the good outweighs the bad and questionable editing-wise by a large amount. Out of curiosity, anything you would have changed editing-wise seeing the reaction of the season? Also, what the fuck is up with the dildo? And why did you <laughs> to half-ass blur it? I have a million other questions for you and I'm tired of writing it, so have fun with that. Um, where do I start with that? First of all, thank you for the, uh, compliment that is, you would call me the best survivor editor. That's great. I'll start with the dildo. I, I, I had originally, I just had the dildo in there without any blur, but then I was actually working on the finale on the plane to Vegas, watching it through the last time. And, uh, I was, there was someone sitting next to me, like an el like a somewhat elderly, uh, gentleman. And he looked over at my computer screen and saw the dildo and crouch. And he just kind of like, kind of like gagged a bit or like had this look on his face. Like what, what, what is going on basically? And I realized that, you know, like my parents watched the show, like my mother watched the show. I know a lot of the cast parents watched the show. And I was like, I, I think that this, even though the show is kind of like a uh, hard PG 13 leading R in terms of the language, like there's a lot of f bombs, and you usually only get one f bomb per PG thirteen movie. So we're leaning hard, hard R in terms of language, but it's mostly meant to be a family friendly show to a degree, you know. And we don't want to have like sexually explicit content on the show. And so I was like, all right, maybe I blur out the dildo. But like, there was no like good way to blur it. That wasn't it to seriously blur it. It would have looked so weird that I was sort of like, all right. This is just, I'll blur it. I was also worried about YouTube censors, like, taking it down for some reason. I, like, wasn't super clear on, like, how YouTube operates with, like, more nefarious, like, illicit content like that. I tried to blur it. I realized I sort of couldn't fully blur it. And I was like, maybe it's funnier if you, like, can basically see what it is, but know that he tried to blur it. Like, Crouch, when he filmed that confessional, he just came over to my house just with that. And he's just, like, <laughs> fucking around with it. And I was like, yo, do you want to take this out of the frame? And he's like, why, bro? 
Is it bothering you? He's what do you mean? He's like, this is my this is my thing, man. Like, I'm doing this today. I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, why do you it's like why do you have that, Crouch? He's like, what do you mean? Do you not have one? Like, I was like, okay. <laughs> So that's why the dildo. Maybe he just like walked over to your house and just brought like j- just brought just himself and, and the dildo. He's like, all right, all right, I'm gonna film the confessional. That's right, yeah. Um, uh, and he was very confident at that point that he was gonna be in the game that they were voting off Cooper. So, what other actual questions were in this? Uh, why the Pringle Idol? I think I've talked about this before, but the two main reasons for the Pringle Idol was it made Emily and Crouch's stories much more interesting. Uh, Crouch, you know, he doesn't think he, I always try and show the game from the player's point of view and Crouch thinks he has a fake idol the whole time. And Emily thinks she has a real idol. And in the original cut of the season about, I got about halfway through the season editing it this way. Uh, it was just played for laughs completely. And you knew the whole time that Crouch, the joke was Crouch's charm would say real idol thinks it's fake. And Bachwick's charm said fake idol thinks it's real. And it was just played for laughs constantly. Like, Oh, they're both just idiots basically. But like, and you see, like, on the recent season of Survivor, they clowned on that girl, Jamie, for having a fake eye. But the thing is, first of all, Crouch had really good reasons to think it was fake, and Bachwick had every reason to think it was real. So I didn't think it was really fair in the edit. Again, again, I've tried to, like, be honest to the story and to the players. And I don't think it's fair to clown on them for something that was, like, pretty legitimate. Like, they're, the longer the season go- went on and the less nobody else had this Pringle idol, like, Bachwick's belief it's real is being legitimized over and over and it's in the exact spot the clues led to nobody else has ever mentioned having it it looks real it's with the real paper it makes sense it's real crouch has all these legit reasons for thinking it's fake that his clue is the wrong number and it kind of looks like a piece of shit and like lots of people could have gotten there before him and uh so it made sense to me that we shouldn't be treating them like clowns and i like the mystery aspect it added a nice little flair to the season I actually got the idea from scotty survivor with their puppet master season it inspired me and gave me the idea. So I give them credit for that. You should go watch Sky Survivor season two if you haven't seen that. But um, so they inspired me for that idea. I thought it was a really cool mystery to, that we could kind of drag out. One thing is originally it was revealed at the end of episode 11 in the original version. It was actually this was this case until the day the episode came out when I changed my mind. Um, originally, after all the trailer for like the final batch of episodes and stuff, after Emily Vegas voted off the scene at the very end of that episode, it actually shows Crouch. It shows Emily B saying, oh, at least they won't know who has the idol. Ha ha ha. And it was going to cut to Crouch and like show that he has the real idol. It was going to come up and say real idol has the Pringle idol. But the last second I changed my mind because I decided that I thought that wasn't satisfying enough. I thought that it had been built up so high in people's minds at that point that I thought we let's wait to reveal it until he plays it. Um, because it just felt like that was a more exciting time to reveal it. And I think it honestly would have worked either way. But I'm happy with the way that it ended up. I do think it also would have worked as a post credit scene, which I like the idea of. But I think the way it worked out was also fine and fun. Yeah, I mean, it, it would have worked there, but I feel like the it makes more sense for the kind of climax of that storyline to end at like a big idol play at a tribal council than kind of like, okay, Emily's voted off. And like, all right, also here's like, it's kind of like post credit scene that everyone might not even see. Like, oh yeah, like, yeah. Okay, the storyline is done too. Yeah, exactly. Like, what if people don't see that? Yeah. Because it was so central to Emily's storyline, there was a part of me that felt like we should know when she goes out. Yeah. But it's fine. On the rewatch, like, you, you'll you understand that her storyline is even more tragic than originally thought, that the idol she thought she had, the plan she thought she had, was never going to work. Um, By the way, funny insider thing on that, which I'm, I'm bummed I, I messed this up, but when, I, when me and Jack did our... Uh, and Sarah did our interview with Emily. Um, we basically like, we obviously at the time that like she was voted off, uh, the audience doesn't know that her idol is fake. So uh, we had we had this whole like extra segment of the interview, maybe like five or ten minutes or so, just talking about the idol and like all the idol stuff and uh, what her thoughts were on it, and you know how, when she realized it was fake and like what she was like watching it and everything. And like the whole idea was like, all right, we're gonna cut all this out and put this like 10 minute section into like, you know, we'll show you later, like basically like end of the season, maybe I'll like attach it onto like one of our other interviews or episodes. Um, so it was obviously that was cut from like the original interview. Like you don't have her talking about the idol at all, but I lost that. I ended up like losing the footage of like that, like the original footage of her, of her saying all of that. Like I was cleaning out my like computer and like 
whatever. I was dumb. I just like deleted the source footage. So now like that footage is just like gone forever. I'm like, all right, well, I guess no one's ever going to hear what Emily thinks about this. Like 10 minutes long of like Emily talking about like her fake idol, just like completely gone. Like, Oh bro, that's, that's tough. Like, Deleting stuff. This is why I don't delete anything ever. I have a copy of every yeah. single thing that ever exists, you know, like, cause I don't know when I'll need it. Well, the thing is, I always think that uh, I always thought it was fine. I was like, all right, well, I don't really need like the source footage of these interviews. Like I, I like all of them are on YouTube anyways. Like, but like that was one instance where like, cause like, usually it's like, all I do is I cut out, I cut down like whatever, kind of like the nothing, like dumb, like sections of, the, of like the interviews that like are not really needed. So I was like, all right, if I reasonably needed footage, I could always just like re-download it from YouTube, like YouTube the MP4. But that's one instance where like I recorded something that like wasn't in the YouTube episode. And I also happened to be like the one time I deleted footage because I had like every interview ever in my computer all at once. I was like, okay, I don't need all this. Like I can delete like whatever 10 gigabytes worth of stuff right now. And uh, yeah, rip. So sorry, just Emily. Stuff. Just a bungling, bungling. bungling. Uh, what other questions in here can I answer? This guy said, Abby, uh, including Abby, that was disgusting. I mean, look, Abby was a part of the season. It's a, it's a less entertaining product if we don't. Some people were like, oh, just we shouldn't have known who leaked it and this kind of stuff. It's like, no, it's a character we're familiar with. And it also like it retcons Abby from like, no offense, Abby. I love you. I don't think you ever watched this. So you, but even if you did, you wouldn't be offended by this. It's like not the most, you know, memorable player from season two. But now she's like, a, you know, infamous icon of College Survivor. And I thought that was like very exciting also that Abby in one 10 minute scene goes from somebody you probably barely remember to a name that will always live on in infamy amongst College Survivor. So, yeah, yeah maybe the I know that some people felt the Abby intro sequence was a bit over the top. But my take on all this stuff was like once it happened and I wish it hadn't happened, but once it happens, I'm going to make the most entertaining version of it possible. And the most entertaining version possible was to, again, have this arch villain of Abby show up yeah. and, you know, use her in some way. And it's kind of like, you know, you're showing kind of like, I mean, Abby doing that was like a big moment. And it's kind of like, it's almost like you don't hate the messenger, hate the, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you're almost like, it's not like you're just the messenger because like, obviously you can shape the narrative the way you want to as the editor. But like, in a sense, you're just telling, you're just telling people what happened, you know? Like, you didn't have to give Abby your own title sequence, I guess. But in a sense, it kind of was, like, it kind of was her revenge. Like, it kind of, Abby kind of did have a moment that, like, was big. And, you know, it, it kind of makes Yeah, sense. I mean, she was getting revenge on production for not casting her. And if, produ like, this is what I said. I think production should have just cast everybody. Production was asking for something like this to happen. Because these people are all petty and competitive and crazy. You know, they we cast them on these shows to begin with because we knew they were competitive and crazy and petty and that's what makes them good tv but that also means that when we as production unilaterally decide now we have the right to decide who's no longer a member of our club you know like that's what it was we we're saying all these people participate in the club and now we're saying this semester we decide who's good enough to be in the club still you know that was a little cruel in a certain way and especially we only cut four people and uh like back in high school i went to a small high school in my theater program we never did cuts for the shows. And then one day we did Into the Woods and we they said we were going to do cuts now. And they ended up cutting three kids and there was five kids cast as trees. Now you ask me, what is the difference between five kids cast as trees and eight kids cast as trees, right? Yeah. Nothing. They told these three kids, you're not good enough to be a tree. You're not good enough to just stand there and say yeah, nothing. Like bushes or something, right? Three bushes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like all these kids had to do is stand there and like, yeah. you know, they just wanted to be a part of it. And we, we told these guys, you're not good enough. And especially, like, I don't think the line between the people who got cut and the people who made it in was, like, so drastic. I mean, the casting meeting went on for, like, seven hours of everybody fighting about it. So, like, once it was established that a lot of these people are kind of on the same level, let's just cast them all. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah, honestly, it's, like, at that point, like, you you either got to go to the extreme of, like, you only cast 16 and you only cast, like, people you think were like really like whatever all-stars in their first season or you go with everybody but like this kind of like 21 it almost feels kind of like a half measure of like all right well like let's let's include as many people as we can't let's include a lot of people but like not everybody but it's like all right like at that point like if we had had 50 people apply we obviously couldn't do a cast of 50 but we had like 26 people apply we could have just cast them all you know um and when i say 26 is because lavana also applied but then dropped out so, like, there was five people who applied who didn't end up playing. Lavana got on, but then she dropped out. 
and then actually got Dylan in. So, but uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the Abby stuff, obviously not good. Wish it hadn't happened. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. It was bad for the game, but it was good TV. It was damn good TV. And, uh, you know, people, you, you love the Joffrey, you love Joffrey Baratheon, you know, and you need to have your villains. And Abby was a true villain on this season. Of the, of all the people I said, everybody's a hero, everyone's a villain. I I can say that Abby was uniquely solely a villain on this season. Yeah. That's if, you, if you want your hero, Abby, go where you watch season two. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so there, what else is in this? Anything else in there you want to comment on? Not really. I think I'm, I think I'm pretty much good on that comment. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that's all the audience questions, at least. I mean, anything else you want to. Were any of these production ask? questions like interesting? You can look through them. Um, they're all, a lot of them are kind of similar to what we've already talked about. This one's saying, do I regret overhyping the season? Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Um, this is interesting. Matthew Israel and I have talked about this, and it's like, it's like, first of all, even if we did think the season was bad, in what scenario are we not going to hype it? Like, this is our show. Like, we're going to promote it. We're going to say it's good. At no point would we ever say, oh, yeah, like, at, we, we, like season four. We hyped season four, and a lot of people thought season four wasn't very good from the production standpoint. So at no point were we going to say, oh, by the way, guys, this is like the bad season before All-Stars. Like, don't worry about it. You know, like, it, it's okay, but like, All-Stars will be better. It doesn't make any sense. We're never going to do that. So even if we had thought it was bad, we were going to say it was good regardless because it's our show. Like, why would you watch our show if we tell you it's bad? That doesn't make any sense. Like, that just doesn't make any sense at all. But second of all, we also truly believed what we were saying and thought that it was, like, the best thing ever. And that's what I, like, put into all of the trailers and all of the, like, uh, like everything about it was, like, this is the defining chapter. Like, this is what people will remember about Survivor Michigan Gen 1 will be this season. Um, and... Uh, I stand by all of that. I think that I hyped it accurately. And I mean, the episode mm -hmm. lengths, the titles, the music, every single thing of the intro, every single thing about it, there was, we put way more into it than any of the previous seasons. I mean, Oh yeah. Um, so I, no, I stand by all of that. And I don't think that like lowering the hype level would have changed people's opinion of it. I think that people, because they cared so much, they had their own impressions of how it was going to go, you know? And, uh, it's hard to live up to the hype. Like I think this was one of the more hyped college seasons ever, probably. And certainly one of the most discussed and one of the most, uh, I think because people, our show had become a real, real, real TV show to people. They felt comfortable. A lot of these other college seasons, you know, and not, not to disparage any of them. There's so many great, great college survivors, but there is some aspect of certain fan made stuff that you're not going to criticize it too much because it's fan made, you know? And, you know, people are doing it out of love and passion and, and we are too, but I think that survivor Michigan had started to transcend to that and people who watched it started to feel like it was just like a real TV show and they're comfortable criticizing it because it felt like a, it felt closer to a real show to them. And that makes me happy at the end of the day. Cause that means we did something really impressive. That means that we made something that people don't feel like it was just made in the backyard. It wasn't just like thrown together by some people that love survivor. It was really thought about. It was really like, you know, um, yeah, there's no pity, it. like kind of like, oh, like good job, like so, you know, it's like right, being right. judged on merit as like right, so media, yeah, yeah. So that felt good. It felt good to know that people cared about it enough to criticize it. Um, which, if they didn't care about it, they wouldn't feel comfortable saying those things. So, you know, I was impressed by the um, amount of reaction to it, and I don't think that I think the people who um, uh, wanted slightly different things to happen or the controversial stuff, um, it would people would see it as the same, basically. I don't think that that would really change that much. I do think that if you looked at this question says, my question is what production marketing conversations were like regarding the promotion? Did you anticipate the mixed reactions and how did you manage them? Um, after the season happened, did the players view all stars as the best? And yeah, everybody thought it was the best. Pretty much everybody involved in All-Stars, besides probably like Jackson, thought it was like the best season of Survivor Michigan, pretty much. Pro production, cast, crew, everybody thought that. Everyone thought it all the way. I think most of them still think it. Um, it's just because uh, everyone cared about it. Like, yeah. You know, other seasons you kind of see, there's always a few people in the cast that either aren't playing that hard or like don't really know what they're doing. But 
this one you had 21 people who were like the person the people playing the least amount on this season were probably like above playing if they were if that was on a, if you place that person with somebody on any of the other seasons they'd be like an above average person yeah. on the other ones yeah if you put like the people who were trying the least hard in this season you probably they'd probably be dominating on like season four or season two like so it's like yeah they're um people care the most about it and i think that like uh you get used to it watching it so you probably is harder to understand that like the levels of strategy people were employing was much deeper than any other season you know like people were thinking about schemes upon schemes of lies to tell each other and going like 16 levels deep into stuff i mean by the time we had moments like kevin and jackson trading fake advantages both trying to screw the other one or you know the the, the way the three two one blindside worked in final six and uh like the whole reason Megan gets voted out is because everybody is worried about a fluke scenario in which Cooper happens to have an idol happens to play it on himself. And like, who are the backup votes going on in an, in a tribe with only eight people at that point and crouch has two immunities. They're worried about who is crouch going to give a second immunity to what happens if Cooper happens to have an idol. So we need a plan in case crouch gives the immunity to Cooper. We need a plan in case crouch gives the immunity to Megan. We need a plan. If he gives it to neither of those people, we need a plan. If he gives it to Cooper, but there's an idol played on Megan. We need a plan. If he gives it to Megan, there's an idol played on Cooper. We need a plan. If Cooper doesn't have an idol, we need a plan. If Cooper finds out that it's him, we need a plan. If he doesn't find out like that, it's, those levels of things are not going on in other seasons of survivor Michigan. So I think strategically, emotionally, um, and, uh, entertainment value wise par for the course person for person, the confessionals were better. The tribals are more dramatic tribal councils. People were funnier at were more engaged and were sick because they knew each other. They're more willing to be open about what's going on. Um, the two, two, it, one, one, one. That's never two, happened before. Yes, two, 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 one has never happened in the history of Survivor. That vote at final seven. Um, this is the first two, 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 one ever. Um, uh, yeah. So you know, between that, the double tribal, Abby Gate, Kevin flipping on Will, uh, you know, the list goes on. And on. Nick not playing his idol. The list goes on and on. The the Blackwick blindside, the Adam vote, the Megan vote, the Crouch tribal. Like Bree tried that Bree was blindsided into the final three, you know, like when else mm -hmm. have I ever seen somebody a scenario where both people at final four think they're going home and they're just like, they're both like blindsided basically. Um, I mean, yeah, I thought that par for the measure for measure is the best season of survivor Michigan. And for me, one of the best survivor seasons I've ever seen in terms of, obviously I'm going to say I made it, but like um, for me, at least it stood up to be exactly what I wanted it to be. And I wish that everybody, every single person who watched it felt that way, but you know, you can't please everybody and that's life. And I'm not going to, the people it meant the most to it, it came across exactly how I wanted it to. So I don't really regret anything. And I also think that it'll age well in time. I think that yeah, yeah. as time goes on, more people will come around to like, wa watch like current CBS seasons and like, tell me that they're giving every person this full kind of story that we gave them here, you know? Yeah, um, they're not they're just not so no i mean you watch like season 44 we had uh two people in the final five were like i barely remember their names because they're just not really in the season yeah you know? yeah i mean one thing i love about college drivers is the seasons feel distinct and different and it still feels fresh it still feels like new things can happen in the game it still feels like the dynamic isn't set and i feel like more and more with cbs survivor at least um i actually prefer australian now but more and more for CBS Survivor, I feel like um, the game feels very similar every time. It feels very, very similar. It doesn't feel like a lot of new things are happening. And so I'm just not as interested in it as I am like more college Survivor. So. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do think that on a rewatch, like it's much more, I think it'll be, as much as it was very enjoyable the first time around, it's like, I think that like you might even enjoy it even more the second time, like just because of how many things you'll notice that you haven't noticed before, especially if you've listened to this whole podcast and like, you know, the amount of things that were, that you're talking about, Ian, that, you know, pay attention to the Chirons and to like the, the theme music in the background and to like Jesse's revenge. Time. Every time Jesse's revenge is mentioned or the, the girls Alliance there's a specific piece of music that's played. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even, like, every line, if somebody says something that you think, like, doesn't fit within, like, the sequence, it's probably, like, it's probably either tying up some 
storyline or it's like foreshadowing or something, you know, like pay attention to those things that stick out because it's like, I, I think there's so much that you, ca you can't really glean from like the first watch. Like I've watched these episodes three, four times and even like the fourth time I'll like notice something I didn't notice before. I'm like, oh, like I didn't even realize that this whole time that's what that was talking about, you know? Um, yeah, so and there's also a season where everything leads into something else. Every little thing yeah. in the early episodes is directly feeding into like Domino's way down the line. You know, the, the girls alliance is an easy example that it's mentioned in the very, very first episode that Jesse wants to form a girls alliance. And this girls alliance ends up unraveling Cooper's entire game. You know, it ends up being a massive factor after Jesse's gone. She doesn't even really get to see, she's like Moses in the Old Testament. She doesn't even get to go to the promised land and see this girls yeah. alliance really take power. But um, it has this dramatic, dramatic impact on the game. And there's a lot of, a lot of little things like that. Like Kevin flipping on Will is a much more, even more monumental moment when you realize how much it's going to fuck over so many other people <laughs> beyond yeah. just Will himself. And then even like every single Kevin and Will interaction, like yeah, in I'll episode look. one through three, that you probably the first time you're like, oh, like this is an interesting alliance. But the second time you're thinking like, oh, like I know where this is going to lead. Like this is this is tragic. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's another great example. And there's tons and tons of scenes like that. Um, I think Cooper and, Leia. Leia, Cooper and Leia, yeah. Like when you know that the ultimate end game is these two people doing everything they can to tear each other down, seeing in the early part of the game how much they're with each other and how much people are afraid of going, like, are they ever going to turn on each other? That's like a major thing that's getting discussed. And ultimately, the entire end game revolves around the two of them, like wanting each other out as badly as possible. And that's like, I, I think, especially pay attention in the first episode, like, ever, I feel like every single line and that like intro is like extremely important yeah in the first like 20 minutes the really really set up every single person like basically telegraphs what's going to happen to every person if you if you pay attention to it like so. cooper and leia's intro is literally like them talking about these different like oh yeah we're gonna be close but like cooper's like i'm gonna whatever you know, whatever it takes going in body bags you know whatever and leia's like has this kind of wholesome like oh like friendship you know so the first episode first 10 minutes you, you know what's happening with cooper and leia yeah oh one thing i wanted to talk about was the quotes the quotes at the beginning oh of yeah yeah because i don't think i really talked with this too much um originally i was only planning to do three quotes the premiere the merge and the finale because those ones i'd had in my head for the Steve Prefontaine quote I had had in my head since season season two, since All Stars happened. I knew I wanted to open it with the uh, to give anything less than your best. It's a sacrifice, the gift. And I I thought that the quotes I wanted to would be representing not just they'd be representing like two things, the player's view of the game and like and also my own view of doing it as the editor and like what I put into it. So, you know, that quote opened all stars to me is like, these people are about to give everything they possibly have to this, you know, and it also is how I felt about things. It's like a quote I really think makes sense that if you uh, give any, if you're like not trying your best, basically, like, why are you even trying, essentially, like, you're just sacrificing your potential, pretty much, you know, like, you got to try your hardest at everything you do, because uh, it's a waste if you don't. And I feel like all stars definitely exemplify that, and, like most people like really did try their hardest. The merge quote was, um, oh my God, what the fuck was the merge quote? It was, uh, oh yeah, yeah. I have learned through painful experience that the most important step a person can take is always the next one. And I thought about that a lot in editing because mm -hmm. it's like, this was a, like, this was like climbing a mountain, you know, it was like writing a novel. Like it yeah. felt at times like even getting even getting one of these episodes done was going to be how it was going to take me forever. And to get 15 of them done, sometimes I just felt impossible. But the only thing you can do is one scene at a time, one clip at a time, one sequence at a time, one episode at a time, just one foot in front of another. The most important step you can take is the very next one. It's not like the most important step isn't the last one. It's not the first one. It's the next one. Whichever step is next is the most important step. Um mm -hmm. And that's the case for survivor players also the most important week is this week you know like getting yeah. through this week is the most important thing you can do because next week is always next week and the past is in the past so um i thought that really hit home and the final one which was you know i began the journey alone i ended it alone but it doesn't mean i walked it alone was also in my head from very early on because it fits with survivor in that 
obviously only one person can win. And at the beginning of the game, it's also kind of everyone kind of understands that. But through the course of the game, you build these alliances and you become close with people and it becomes more of a complicated, complicating factor. And ultimately, as an editor, like I kind of also began and ended it by myself, but there was a ton and ton of other people who helped along the way. And I would both like you couldn't win Survivor without other people's help and you couldn't edit the seasons without other people's help either. So it felt like a very like um, cool quote. So originally it was just going to be those three, but then the act, the other episode, then the, the last three episodes all ended up getting quotes because Sam and I were talking about it. And I was like, is it weird that like the, the like the, the three act structure, there was a quote at the beginning of the first act being in the second act. Is it weird? There isn't one at the beginning of the third act. And you were like, yeah, it is kind of weird. Like there should be one basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it made sense to, to yeah. open up like the third act with a quote. But I think, the this, editing... is, oh, I think this is one minor editing regret I have is because I actually, I couldn't find a quote I really liked for the beginning of the third act. And I ended up going with this Sinatra quote that was, and now the end is near. And so I faced the final curtain. And the reason that I didn't like that quote was because it wasn't, I also wanted the quotes to all be something that like, or like a personal thing for me. Yeah. And like the Prefontaine thing is like a thing that used to be a big thing on my cross country team in high school. And it was like a personal thing for me. And the other quotes were also per- things that meant something to me personally. I don't have any real personal connection to Frank Sinatra. He's not like an artist I'm super about or like, I don't have yeah. an issue with him, but he's not saying it's not a personal connection to me. And the quote that I put at the end of the, at the beginning of the next episode, the, at the Sophie's choice one, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And I wish that if I had thought of that quote, um, earlier i think i would have not done quotes for episodes 11 12 or 12 13 and 14 and i would have just had if you choose not to decide you still have made a choice of the rush song um free will i think i would have had that quote at the beginning of act three and there wouldn't have i would have done quotes for act one two three in the finale because i am i do love rush and i think that choosing not to decide and still make a choice that that encompasses the whole final act i think so I would have been fine with that, but I'm not unhappy with all those episodes having quotes the last act because they feel more epic, but yeah. it was a bit much. I don't think every episode needed one. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, I think that at least at the same at the same time, like, you know, all of them might not have as much meaning as each other, but it's still a good quote. Like, the, the Sinatra quote still does kind of, like... Yeah, it, it definitely applies to both. You know what? You oh read, yeah. Also, what happened in the season? Maybe not in the same like personal connection to Frank Sinatra specifically, but it does. It does definitely. Um, I thought you were going to talk about when you, when you first mentioned this. I thought you were going to talk about the uh, the quotes in the title sequence. Oh, didn't I? I think I explained that in the first part of this interview. Yeah, yeah, I think you did. I think you did. That was also yeah. very very intentional. Definitely. I'm, I'm like 95% sure I talked about that already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the quotes and the title sequences all being blast, both flashback and foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Cause I was talking about how you were the one who changed the most and all that kind of stuff. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause definitely we'll, watch we'll the title sequence. I was very proud of the title sequence. I had really high hopes for how the yeah. title sequence would turn out. And I was, I had an image in my head of it for a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. And I think it turned out like pretty cool. It, I wanted it to be special. I wanted it to feel unique. And I think it really captured like the epic feel of the, of the scope of the whole thing. Well, I also think it was cool that you experimented a lot with them and did like different style of intros. Like there's probably at least three or four episodes that have kind of like their completely own title sequence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's the Abby one and then you guys didn't want the attack on Titan one. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I kept that. I think that that, Basically, the final, the whole final act had its own title sequences, basically. Like, yeah. that was another thing for me was the music that's used in the title sequence for episodes uh, 13 and 14 is, like, the final, like, kind of action-y version of the All-Stars main theme. And it was something kind of cool to me that at um, when I first got into Survivor Michigan, I really wanted to, com- to get a version of the Survivor theme that had the Victors, the Michigan fight song, like, in it somehow. And I had some music friends of mine try to like work on it and they didn't really do a very good job. And like, it didn't sound very good. So that's something maybe in the future of Survivor Michigan, I'd still love to see that one day. I don't know how exactly it would sound, but I think it'd be cool. But I always want us to have our own version of the title theme of the Survivor song. You know, I always wanted it to be unique and special. And this felt like a way for us over the course of the season. It's like we fully transitioned into our own show as much as possible. And now like 
it, it, by the time you get to that theme music, it fits and it feels like it felt very much like this music fit these last couple episodes and they have their own music for the title sequence because this is the theme for our show. It's different than the main Survivor theme, but it's becomes the theme of the All-Stars, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the music is something that, like, I mean, I, I've always loved, like, just music that's like used in, in like movies and shows and stuff. Like I literally like, even since I was like a kid, I would listen to soundtracks from like movies that I liked. And uh, just because it like, since the music is so like important and like kind of just framing your mindset when you're watching something and can like, just feels like a, I don't know, can almost be like a soundtrack for life or you'll think about like different things like the music Music is like for me, like it doesn't always need to have lyrics. Like it, it can just be something that's like a, a music just puts you into a certain vibe, you know? And that's what I loved about one of the things I loved about what you did with All Stars is that like the music sets the scene. It wasn't just kind of like some random filler music uh, in each scene. It just kind of like something playing in the background, but like it was very intentionally chosen to make you feel a specific way. Like, you know, or even to like tell a story, like maybe a certain music theme music is used to like kind of uh, underscore a certain thing that's happening or like kind of show you like, oh, like this is the girls alliance or this is Megan and Jackson or like this is the friendship or this is like villainous or whatever, you know, it's meant to make you feel a different, a certain way. And I think that like, there's something that maybe like upon viewing, you might not even notice the first time. There's a lot of times I don't even notice it, but it, it still makes you feel a certain way. So even if you're not actively like, oh, like this is what music is playing. I understand this. It's just kind of like it makes you feel a certain way, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I love like soundtracks to movies and TV shows and stuff. And like the music is such an important part of every great show. Every like truly great show or movie has like a great soundtrack, you know? Yeah. So, um, and Survivor is no exception to that. Like the Survivor music is really good. And oh, we started yeah. expanding farther and farther out from, uh, I remember in the season two finale, I used some tracks from uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2003 TV show. I, if you can't tell, also through All Stars, if you just look at the music choices and the kinds of things that are referenced, you can get yeah. a pretty good sense for the kinds of things that I like just in different parts of my life. So like there's a lot of Ninja Turtles music. There's a lot of Star Wars in like the um, trailers, Stranger Things. Uh, Attack on Titan, Avatar in the finale, um, all kinds of stuff, Bionicle, a lot of weird kind of like geeky stuff that I liked when I was younger and still like uh, is all over these things. Um, so you can get a set Kids Next Door, a lot of different stuff I liked and at various stages of my life, I just referenced in the show, basically. Um, oh, that's another good music thing I didn't talk about was that the very, um, the final music before the like end credits epilogue was this, was, um, an epic version a samuel mm. kim a samuel kim who's like a youtube music artist guy he did yeah. an epic version of the avatar theme and the avatar theme i used in the season two trailer so to me it was a two front thing it was like first of all the you actually hear the season two trailer avatar music a couple times throughout final tribal when sam is talking so first of all it's kind of like it's kind of like a sam theme that comes in at that point um even though you already had your kind of hit list theme this is like a different one um it's also like a season two theme because season two player is going to win and for me personally the first survivor video i made the season two trailer had this avatar music and so the very i i thought this music would be perfect for the very last ending also basically um yeah uh and so that felt very very full circle and that music also worked really really well just for the vibe it's a very victorious sort of uh it feels kind of emotion. It feels like uh, emotional, but also victorious. Mm -hmm. And so it just felt yeah, like the just perfect a, it's just a survivor thought. type feel too. Like it feels kind of mm -hmm. like, I don't even know how to describe like what feels like survivor. It's like, it's like a sort of tribally islandy kind of thing. Bionicle yeah. music also really fit it. There's certain sorts of shows and like vibes that just mm -hmm. kind of like feel like survivor basically. So. Yeah. 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 No, that was, that was a good one. I, I love the, I don't know if I caught it. I don't know if I necessarily made that connection until you mentioned it, but like, it's cool that it works on multiple levels as in kind of like for mm -hmm. yourself, your first and last thing. And then uh, this the season two connection in general of like, okay, the season two player wins and then there's the season two trailer. So it's yeah. Like, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
And then I really like. like go ahead. Or sorry, I was like the go the distance song also for the yeah. end end credits is like obviously that I had that picked out. I remember listening to that like I'm during editing season three for sure that summer of the pandemic. So I think it was around that time I decided that was going to be the last music in All Stars, and I always had it in mind it was going to show everybody. It was going to go through every single player from all the seasons, and it was going to uh, end on this, you know, like um, the hundred to like, you know, the friendships that lasted like a hundred days and more, which was the hundred days of the season, obviously. And like, if you've played any of these games, it's about that. It's about the community you formed around it. It's always about the friends we made along the way. You know, that's like the most important thing with all these kinds of things. Um, I read an interesting article about Steven Spielberg once that was saying that it was essentially argued that every like uh major movie director like steven spielberg christopher nolan etc they're just telling the same story over and over again in different ways and i don't think that's like 100 percent true but i definitely think there's something to that that like spielberg tells a lot of stories about childhood and about like um parents and like stuff like that and etc cetera, etc cetera. other people have these sorts of things as well and i definitely think that um my thing is uh communities that's like the story I'm interested the most in telling and the moral of the story that I always tell is always like the most important part of the story was just the people that we met along the way, basically. Hmm. Um, which sounds kind of cheesy, I guess, and simplistic, but I don't know. It's really not. It sounds, it's very impactful to me. I think it's an important, it, it's an important story to be telling as much as anything else. So the go the distance was like the distance that obviously the winner went. You won the seat, like winning the season. It's like you had to go the distance. Also the distance of this journey we've all gone on watching the show, playing in it, being friends, whatever. And obviously the distance of the editing. They're like, if yeah. I, I always was like, I was just like, I want to get to that moment where I'm watching that part of the episode with all these other people, because then I'll know that I did it basically. Mm -hmm. And I'll know that I went the distance in that moment. And so I did. So that felt good. And I had that in my head for so long, you know? And when I, edit, I didn't have like the Shannon clip when I watched season four and I saw that Shannon and Kat clip, I immediately was like, all right, that also is going in there, obviously, because that's like a thesis statement about all of this. Yeah. It was really emotional watching that, uh, watching that scene because it was like the end of everything, you know? Yeah. I debated for a really long time at the very, very end, right? It said the end. And for a long time, I was like, should it say nothing? Should it say like end of era one or something? I prefer era to the term generation because I just think era sounds cooler, basically. Yeah. Um, but like act one, it said end of act one, act two is end of act two. So I was like, should it say, should it say end of all stars? But that I had it for a long time as end of all stars. But then when I was watching it through, it didn't, that didn't feel right because that epilogue wasn't really about the end of all stars you know it was about yeah. the end of all of it so it felt kind of reductive to go back to like oh this is the end of all stars when the last three minutes has been about this was about like seasons one through five this is about all these people it wasn't just about the all stars so in the end i just decided i didn't want to do end of era one though because that like i wanted to i want to hype up these other seasons obviously and like everyone should go watch them and stuff but i also really want i didn't want the last beat of it to feel like oh wait but there's more and saying end of anything one, you'd implicitly think like, okay, well, what about era two, you know? Because the end of seasons two, it. yeah, the end of seasons two, three, and four, the beat of it was always, okay, but there's more, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was a trailer for each season at the end of the, all three of those. And I really wanted the end of this to not feel like, oh, wait, but there's more. I wanted us to like be able to breathe with it and have a moment to mourn it, you know? Yeah. And there is more, but it won't be quite the same. It will be slightly different. It won't be this it won't be this particular story it'll be a different kind of survivor story it was like the end of the story that was being told you know like there's survivor michigan as a whole has more stories to be told but the story that was being told in all stars like it was it was done that was the end yeah i said it's the avengers endgame comparison you know i use that comparison lots of times i think it's like a pretty apt comparison that's the only marvel movie without a post credit scene and i like i think i read they 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 felt very similarly that the post credit scene would really devalue the ending they were trying to like tell. Yeah. So. Well, that's the end, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, if you've watched all the way through this, 
there is a, if you're interested in any some season six uh inside knowledge spoilers um i won't say what but in the background of a lot of videos i have filmed for all stars so like um post episodes uh maybe even this podcast i don't know there is um a uh a little season six foreshadowing little season six spoiler maybe somewhere oh, in the background maybe a spoiler i don't know in the background mm -hmm. of uh some of some of my videos so maybe even this one i don't know who can say for sure who can say know. who can say but uh yeah if you're interested you can maybe maybe uh look into some of the things that have been in the background of these videos i also think people should go back and rewatch the host announcement video for season five mm -hmm. now that we know that uh uh, George is coming back on season six. That video has some nice tidbits. And just in general, there's a lot of, you'd be surprised now that we know Noah, Katie, there's a lot of season six. You'd be surprised how much season six foreshadowing was uh, in all stars perhaps. So Ooh. definitely, definitely nice. maybe uh, check that out. If, uh, if you watch the old keep your torch lit, you might even see some season six uh, foreshadowing way, way back in the depths. Oh yeah. Actually you have some season six co-hosts, right? We did. We did. Yeah for a little while season three so if you go back you might see uh might be introduced to some of the characters a, little, a bit early yeah a great cast a great cast and uh a truly fantastic season so you know can't wait for everybody to to see it yeah same season six and uh season seven and beyond uh from what i heard they're all great season six i i was involved with production so i you know Literally, I do know what happens. I, I know who's in the cast and, and all that. And incredible. I mean, I've been really excited to watch that for a really long time just because it's also like the first time I'll, since season one, I'll be able to watch like this very fully as a fan who doesn't really have his, any involvement in the editing or being in the season. So I'm really excited for it. It's this fall, you know, it's, it's not even that long from now. It's coming up. Yeah. I'm with you, dude. I'm so excited to watch these as a fan because like, I, like I'm like the number one Survivor Michigan fan, you know, like, yeah. so it's like, I'm so excited to watch. And I just, I'm a like, you know, one of the top college Survivor fans. I've seen like almost every college Survivor mm -hmm. season out there. So it's like, I'm very excited to just watch it uh, as a fan, just enjoy, you know, more college Survivor plug Survivor Ohio state season three is coming out this summer. Also yeah. um, I think Sky Survivor season three is coming out. Those are the two I'm like pretty familiar with that are coming out in the, like this summer, this summer. There's probably others. Um, check those out. Uh, yeah, I saw Survivor Florida State just started up. Yeah. There's always more college survivors, so definitely check all of those out if you liked this one. And Anders also had promised me, he swore, Pinky promised me, that uh, Survivor Maryland Season 8 will be released this year. So, I mean. This year? So that means, like, uh, in, like, July? Yeah, that's what he's next week is what I heard. This year means, like, middle of the year. So, I mean, basically, like – before july 1st that's so, what he said so yeah, i know makes Don't, sense. it's it's his fault you know like talk to him about it Ian, uh great talking uh hearing all your takes on uh on all stars and um cool getting a little sneak peek into season six as well yeah man thanks for thanks for having me it's been a it's been a blast and uh, i can't wait for my uh final keep your torch lit appearance when i uh you know, when uh, season six comes out and at some point I'll, I'll come back and talk to you guys again about season six or whoever is running. Keep your torch yeah. lit then. That'll be great. I'm excited. Excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, you know, keep your torch lit. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some, some new people filtering in at some point, but you know, Jack, Sarah and I uh, will always have, probably some involvement so we're not you're not ever saying goodbye forever but um yeah i'm excited to excited to talk some season six when the time comes sounds good sounds good all right well talk to you later see ya